I'll go ahead and call this uh, council work session to order this Monday, September the 9th. There are two agenda items on uh, uh, our discussion list this evening. The first, uh, transportation concurrency, and the second, regional committees and assignments. Uh, before we jump into the first uh, uh, first item, I would uh, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to talk about uh, what a work session is. Uh, this is an opportunity for the council and staff to discuss items in, uh, uh, in more depth than typically we have time to do that. And it also provides staff and others to get a sense of uh, or where there are concerns and gaps in information or additional information that uh, we might need as we move towards a decision. And it also provides a sense of where we are on an issue. Uh, we're not making decisions here this evening, uh, but uh, uh, many times you can tell by the flow of the conversation, the questions and things like that, where the council informally stands on an issue. But another important uh, aspect of council work sessions is that after each item, uh, the public has an opportunity to comment. And then uh, 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 we have the benefit not only of what we have heard from staff and others, but from the public itself. And of course, these work sessions are televised, so those who have an interest and could not get here uh, can see when it's uh, rebroadcast uh, at a, uh, a future date and see what we have been up to. So with that, uh, uh, I will introduce very, very briefly uh, our first topic, which is transportation concurrency. And our two presenters this evening, uh, Dave Favor, uh, Developmental Development Services Division, uh, and Randy Young of uh, uh, Randy Young, Henderson Young and Company. And Randy, now there are two Youngs in that. Uh, there's Randy Young and, uh, uh, and, and another Young. So are you both of those Youngs? Um, Henderson Young is the last name of the founding partners of our firm, Bill Henderson, um, sadly the late Bill Henderson. Ah. So Randy, here is the, there you go. So when the red light starts blinking up there, that means we've got to reposition our mics just a little bit. Up. So this is not a new topic for us. We've had uh, three different uh, presentations uh, up, up to this point. And uh, uh, in our July meeting, uh, we, uh, uh, we ask for some additional information, and uh, that information is coming back uh, to us now. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. And Dave, uh, one thing I'd like to make sure that, uh, uh, that, that you cover uh, during this uh, is uh, uh, next steps and where we go from here at the conclusion. Great. So with that, you're on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Um, and I'll follow up on your uh, introduction. I'll give a brief introduction, um, some context for tonight's meeting, and to say, it's blinking. Can you hear me now? Yeah? OK. <laughs> Tell me if it keeps blinking. Um, so the context is, yes, we've met several times on concurrency, and we're here tonight. I'm excited to take the next step to, to narrow the focus and go towards um, uh, a simplified solution. So in April, you recall Torsen was with us and hosted the workshop and proposed, kind of helped us learn what is a simplified concurrency approach. We, I heard con con consensus that night, yes, we want to go there. Um, in May, Bob and I talked to council about, again, a work plan to get there. And then July, Dan talked about that simplified approach plus an interim solution that we knew that we thought if it's going to take 18 months or so to do this, we want to have an interim solution and get going right now. So then we went back and did our research. And in doing our research, we, we learned that under our very noses is Mr. Randy Young here, who has been our longtime expert on, on impact fees, as well as municipal finance uh, solutions that you've been working with on this, with the city for uh, many years. 
15 years. Uh, in addition to that, Randy works with other cities to work on the, the simplified concurrency solution. So merging impact fees together with concurrency is something we've been talking about. <coughs> and Randy works on it. And here we are. So this is exciting. Um, so tonight you're asking, what do we what do we want to do tonight? I've I've figured out four things we want to do. Randy's going to go through the PowerPoint you've seen online. We'd like your feedback on that approach. Second, you're going to outline key issues and policy items to be thinking about over the next time period that we work on this. You don't have to answer them tonight, but start highlighting them. And then third, we have a draft work plan on the last slide, and then uh, this afternoon we been working very rapidly to prepare a more detailed work plan and that was emailed to you just hours ago and we have uh, handouts prepared if you'd like to look at it you don't have to um, to give you details on that so that's item three to react to that work plan and then number four is it's budget time 2014 budgets coming up and we'll be talking with you if you'd like to talk about kind of a range of funding range that you can expect to see in the budget request so those are Four things to be thinking about. Great. As well, I'll turn it over to this gentleman, unless great. you have anything more to add. Well, just quickly, uh, there are a number of folks who typically are not at this meeting, so I would ask uh, uh, Trish if you would identify yourself and the role that you play in this, and then Dan and John and Charlie and uh, Bob. So, Trish. Okay, I'll start. I'm Trish Hanonen. I'm from your Development Services Department. I've been lucky enough to work with Randy for all of those 15 years, not only on impact fees and mitigation fees, but also how they fit into the comprehensive plan and how concurrency fits into the comprehensive plan. Uh, Bob, oh, go ahead. You're going this way. Nope. Bob Harrison, the City Administrator, and I've been coordinating with the DSD Department and our uh, staff and consultants on this project. So, Charlie. I'm Charlie Bush, the Deputy City Administrator, and I oversee a number of the departments involved in this effort development services and public works engineering and RH2 and a whole variety of departments as well. John Minato, development services director, and been working directly with Dave and others on the team as we put together the concurrency process that we're proposing. Uh, Dan Urban, DSD, also working with John and Dave and Randy and everyone on traffic concurrency. Great. Okay, Randy. Thank you. I'd like to... Um, start off by uh, just sharing a little bit more about my background because uh, many of you, Trish in particular, I go back to the beginning of my work for Issaquah, but not all of you have seen me all the time. Um, uh, but Ms. Rettler, you certainly have seen me through many sessions, and I thought I'd just share with everyone uh, some, some things that um, I hope will give you a comfort zone about the information I'm going to share with you. Um, first of all, I have done a lot of work in transportation concurrency. Uh, 14 Washington cities and six counties, part of the 35 concurrency systems I've done around the country. Um, I've also done a lot of impact fees, including in a minute we'll be reviewing the many impact fees and mitigation fees I've done for the city of Issaquah. And in fact, I am right now under contract to you and actively engaged in updating your 2006 transportation impact fee and also helping develop a new multimodal mitigation fee, um, which we're very advanced in our development of that, um, probably have something around the first of the year for you in, in that. And that's going to be part of tonight's presentation about how and where those have anything to do with concurrency and how concurrency has to do with who pays for things. At the bottom of the slide, you can see the many projects that I've been involved with, most of them impact fees and mitigation fees for uh, Issaquah since, uh, well, 15 years ago, since 1998. Um, a couple of other background things to keep in mind as we launch into this subject. Before we talk about concurrency, let's just remember that as you sit here tonight as a city council, you're responsible for concurrency, which is part of transportation, which is part of being a city government. And this is just a slide that reminds not you, because you deal with this all the time, but those who may see this on film or on television, that city councils have responsibility for lots of things. And so our focus on concurrency tonight always is in the context of your other responsibilities, and that's what this slide simply reminds us. And as we narrow down and talk just about that last item, mobility, uh, we want to recognize that mobility itself is a complicated subject. People have lots of ways of moving around, and this slide tells us that there are vehicles and bicycles and pedestrians and transit, and you, as the provider of the infrastructure for those, 
take care of the things on the right side of that slide, the streets, the bike lanes, the trails, and the support for the transit system. Uh, about the only thing that you as a city don't do now, and very few cities in Washington do, is you're not the active provider of the, the transit system itself. Um, but you still have uh, your active consumers of it, and you, including your plans, as you've done with your Central Issaquah plan, um, a really thorough understanding of how you can improve transit usage. You have some ambitious, but I think achievable goals to promote that multimodal participation. And we're cognizant of that, and that's part of our discussion tonight, both for mitigation, because we want to get some mitigation income for you for, for transit and for bike and ped, but also how that relates to concurrency. Um, now, as you provide for these different um, mechanisms, these different methods of getting around, you have a number of tools that you use. And this is just a, sh a short list. I'm not going to review them in excruciating detail, but you do a variety of plans so that you think about what transportation mobility is going to look like. You have benchmarks, which is where you set the standard. How much congestion are you willing to tolerate? And at what point are you going to insist that there be some mitigation or some different forms of a development or rethinking that benchmark, that level of service? Um, you, do, you do traffic counts so that you find out how many vehicles and people are out there now using up those benchmarks, and then you do a traffic model that compares the behavior to the benchmarks. You know where, where do you need to make improvements, which leads to the capital plans, the TIP and the CIP, which is your list of projects. What are you going to fix? Where are you going to fix it? How are you going to pay for it? Which leads to how are we going to pay for it, the funding mechanisms. Um, and then at the, at the tail end of this, we have two tools that we use to make sure that we actually accomplish all these other tools. We do reviews of development to make sure that they don't wander away from all these plans and strategies. And we have mitigation fees by which development can contribute to solving any problems that they create. So with these tools in mind, you have, as a city, the ability to manage and help maintain the mobility of your citizens and your businesses. And all these tools are typical of what well-run cities do. But the reason we're here tonight is because you've been hearing things and the development community has been experiencing things about the last two of these that have raised some questions, that have caused some problems. And specifically, we're hearing, and you've heard this from other presentations, some concerns about uh, review which is more than concurrency, but includes concurrency, and about mitigation, which is more than impact fees, but includes impact fees. And these concerns are, number one, that it's really complicated. You have multiple reviews and multiple mitigations, and they are unpredictable. It's very hard for someone who really wants to start a business or add to a business or expand a business in Issaquah to predict what's going to happen when they make that proposal. Um, and so as they try and do their pro formas, their spreadsheets of how much is this going to cost, they're able to look up some parts of it that are very predictable, the impact fees, but they're subject to a, a current approach that you use for concurrency where we're going to run a traffic model that's going to tell them about specific intersections that they might cause to go south and that they might have to mitigate and fix and they might have to fix all of it even though somebody else might come along later and fix it. And that intersection may or may not be on our impact fee list. It's all very hard to predict. And so the development community would look at Issaquah and say, you got a lot of the things going for you. You're not making this part real friendly. Okay? And so they also have a hard time predicting how much time it's going to take. And in the development business, time is money. Sorry for the trite phrase, but it's really true. And so being unable to predict how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost is a problem. Now, what you're going to find is we're not going to recommend that we have no costs and no time. We're not going to throw away what we need to control here. That's going to be on a slide in a minute from now. But I want to assure you that we have ways to think about better ways of doing business. The last thing that I want to mention is a, cons is a real strong concern is the inconsistency of the system. Our, our impact fees look at the system as a whole and say, we need you to pay us to fix all parts of the transportation network that are affected by your business. Not just the street out in front of your business, but the streets that are used by the people who bring your customers to you and the other streets that are used by the suppliers of your goods and, and products. We look at the whole network, and we do that very well under impact fees, and our state law allows us to do that. But we've got a concurrency system that uses a high-powered microscope and dials down to the exact site of the development and goes shopping through a traffic model to find specific intersections that might blow up that maybe we didn't think about and says, 
oh, you've got to fix that one too. And that makes it inconsistent because that may or may not have been something we thought about before, but did we need to think about that if we knew that the development was coming in the first place? I'm going to come back to that question in a moment. So with these concerns, we need to understand that there is a relationship between these two tools, the review tool and the mitigation tool. Review means that we want development to occur when we have adequate transportation, and the state law gives cities very few tools to protect itself, and one of them is concurrency, where you have the ability to say you are violating our levels of service, we can insist that you not do that, as long as we have ways to, for either you to change your development or for you to mitigate those impacts. Well, that review can exist without mitigation. And in fact, there are a number of cities in Washington that have concurrency and have chosen not to have impact fees. So there's no law that says you have to have both. It's also possible to have mitigation without concurrency. There are states where impact fees are in a place, like Arizona, for example, um, Oregon, and they require the developer to mitigate, but they don't require anybody to see whether or not the transportation network is good enough. So what we have in Washington is two tools that we can use well or that we can use badly to protect the interests of a good transportation system with a good level of service. And the problems you've been experiencing that we talked about on the previous slide is they're really complicated, they're hard to predict, they're inconsistent, and what we're going to recommend is a closer coordination. Uh, yes, and I assume we're taking questions as we Absolutely. go? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned two tools. You mentioned uh, impact fees. Yeah. And, and is that really the only option, impact fees? Um, do some, do all our local, all jurisdictions do, you said some don't. Correct. But, um, and, and just, I could be way off base with this, I apologize. So where would something like, well, this is probably more in line with B&O tax, so I may have this wrong. I was going to ask about a head tax, but that may, it may not be in the same category. Uh, no, but when we talk about transportation finance for cities, um, there is a, a form of a business license based on the number of employees, a census-based system. And the attorneys will take all of us to the woodshed if we call it a head tax okay. because it's not a tax. Right. Okay? Yeah. But, but <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> but it is a business license. Um, Redmond has it. Renton has it. Yeah. Kirkland's just adopting it in which the amount of the business license is not a flat fee for the business. It's not 100 or 200 bucks per year per business or even 500. It's $40 per employee per year or $85 per employee per year. And the money is dedicated to a transportation account. Redmond, in order to get, uh, they have a couple small businesses up there. I'm not sure you've heard of um, you know, Microsoft and, you know, uh, right. Um, in order to get their business community to agree to this, they developed a program that sunset the thing after five years, that put the money into a lockbox where it was only going to transportation improvements that the business community agreed were going to benefit the business community, and at the end of five years, the whole thing went away. It worked so well, the business community said, five more. They're now in their third five-year plan. Renton did theirs. They actually did this before Redmond and um, got it going uh, very early in the game, basically to fix one um, connection to the interstate as an off-ramp that they needed uh, to develop the local money. And they had a sunset provision that when that was built, it would end. Uh, the business community in Renton has said, you folks are doing well, you're keeping it in the right uh, place, you're limiting the use of the money to transportation improvements that help businesses. And so they've given them n no sunset provision. It's now permanent. So there are other tools. And, and when I mention two tools, mitigation and other finance is one. And then concurrency and other review is the other that we're talking about. So let's remind ourselves, you've already heard this one twice, once from the mayor, from Mr. Butler and once from uh, uh, Dave. We've, this is not your first rodeo on this subject, okay? Um, I'm using first names for your presenters. You know Torsten Lino from CH2 um, is your transportation engineer. Then Dave and Bob were here in May. Um, Dan was with you in July. Uh, now it's my turn to kind of move the ball a little bit further along. Um, I'm happy to report that my presence here this evening and a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is at the invitation of a very large team of staff people that we met together. Um, and, uh, Dave was there, Trish, Bob, um, 
and Dan was there, John was not able to be there, we had an, uh, uh, about six or seven other folks. So this is not a surprise to them, this is in fact they're saying, wow, we've made some progress, would you like to make the presentation of where we think we might go? And that's what brings me to you this evening. So what do we, th what do we agree on? We agree that the things you did in 2010 to try and improve your concurrency system, as recently as 2010, you were still aware that it needed fixing and you made some fixes, but the consensus is it wasn't enough. It's still too complex, and there's still a chance to simplify it. I'm not going to go back over all the complexities. You've seen great presentations in three previous workshops about that. What I want to do this evening is to talk about how can we make it simple. It's time to quit saying let's make it simple, and my job is to talk about how can you do that. And I don't make any changes to anything unless I have some guidelines, some principles, some things that are going to tell me as I do the nuts and bolts, am I on target? What are my goals? What am I trying to accomplish? And so these are the five principles that I've outlined for you for simplifying your concurrency and simplifying mitigation. And the first two have nothing to do with simplicity. They have to do with protecting the city's interests. And they are, number one, protecting your level of service. You have adopted levels of service. You've spent over the years thousands of council hours and public testimony hours thinking about that, trying to understand it, learning how it works on the ground, and you have the right to change it. And this whole process could lead to that change, although for now we're going to assume that it isn't going to be changed. We're going to assume you had a reason for adopting the levels of service that are in your comp plan and the years you've just invested in your central Issaquah plan, we're going to assume that our job is to protect that, okay? And our second assumption is that we're going to need to improve your transportation network in order to deliver on that level of service. So we expect to have to spend money to fix intersections, to widen roads, to make bike paths, to improve sidewalks, to make transit more friendly. It isn't free, and so we're going to talk about marrying the review concurrency process with the who and how do we pay for it part so that it makes sense. Those are our first two and our most important rules for simplifying. As we keep those in mind, we have three other principles that are very, very important. Fewer steps. Okay? If we can accurately protect levels of service and do it in three steps instead of 30, we should be looking for how to do it in three steps instead of 30. And how can we make it less complex so that it doesn't look like a refrigerator wiring diagram, but it looks like step A, step B, we're done? And how can we make it more predictable? Because one of the biggest success stories for economic development is being able to talk to businesses where they can see what's coming even if it isn't all pleasant, even if they are required to do some mitigation, if they can figure out in advance how much that is, and they can put it into their pro formas when they're deciding whether or not to option property, whether or not to look at your city as a place to come, you take the surprise out of it and you make it a much more inviting place. Okay? And if they can predict the costs and predict how much time, that is, it's not going to take two or three years to get through the process. It's going to take more like six months or three months or two, depends how, how big and complicated the development is. These are the winning strategies for economic development. So with these principles in mind, I want to outline for you and present to you this evening concurrency in three parts instead of 30. Yes. I mean, um, so there's a question, I guess, for a larger group as well. So. So I get this, protecting, of course, the level of service and improving our transportation system, but there was no mention of, of tying these improvements to our plans. I, maybe that was implicit in what you were saying, but let's take the Central Issaquah area, for example. You know, that's, a, that's an ambitious plan. It's got you know, population, job, but infra infrastructure uh, plans in it as well. Could you comment to that? Because yes. you didn't mention tying it to the plans. No, I was, I, I'll take the advantage of your question to talk to it now instead of in a couple slides. I, this is a great time to talk about it because it's, it's a central part of our discussion this evening. Um, when I said a minute ago that we assume that the levels of service that you adopted are the beginning point of our work, if when we present you the end results of simplified mitigation and simplified concurrency, you look at all this and go, Thanks, Randy, but wow, it's really expensive. 
we can't afford the city share and we can't afford to charge developers their full share, uh, we need to revisit this. Then we're going to have to go back to the level of service, which is going to take us back to the plans, which is going to take us back to the project list. Because what drives all of this is the level of service tells us where we need to make improvements. The cost of those improvements tell us how much money we need to raise from both development and from ourselves and from grants. If the project list is right and we have the money, we will meet our level of service. That's what your current TIP does. It lists all those projects, $300 million worth of them, because you need them all to meet your level of service standards. You're going to see from me tonight some early glimpses about what that looks like in terms of how much city money you're going to have to come up with and how much the mitigation fee might be. We've got some early drafts. Okay? Meet the LOS standards and implement the various plans. Th those would be the things, as I said, that would accomplish the plan by delivering the projects and the projects deliver the level of service and the proof that the projects deliver the level of service is the traffic model that takes all the growth that you're forecasting in your plans, figures out where it's going to break the intersections and the segments. We then say, that's what we need to fix. That goes on our TIP list. We add it to our costs. And those costs we have to share between growth and us. Okay? We're going to have some slides that get into those in a little bit more detail. But the principle is your plans drive all of this. Um, I'm struggling with the idea of protecting the level of service vis-a-vis -vis the central area plan where that part of the city is slated to become more dense. Um, because I don't see how you can add density and yet talk about doing infrastructure improvements in other parts of the city just by checking off what's on our TIP. Um, it doesn't seem like it's rationally related or connected. And so I think if people expect density, there's a certain lower level of service that comes with that, as opposed to a more suburban area, higher speed limits, wider roads, that sort of thing. Um, and I don't know whether that was built into the assumption or if it's just sort of a blanket assumption you know, citywide, we average a D for the LOS, therefore, we're going to protect the D. No. No, quite to the contrary. We're, first of all, let's take the Central Issaquah Plan that has way more to it than just level of service D for motor vehicles, okay? One of the reasons I'm here tonight is to share with you not only the update of your transportation or traffic impact fee, but to give you a status report on the development of a, a multimodal mitigation payment system, okay? We developed this for the City of Seattle, and it works. And so we're proposing to develop it for you. So that where density occurs, and part of the problem is more congestion to motor vehicles, and we'll come back to that in a minute, but part of your solution is better walking and biking and, tra and transit, we're going to have a mechanism to develop some of the money for that and to build those trips into the model. So, we're, so part of our solution for density isn't just, oh, well, we're going to accept level of service F. But you are correct that it's a, it's a interesting question whether we'll be able to sustain D at every location, particularly within Central Issaquah, when we get that level of development. That's why we're going to recommend a simplified system that you don't set it and forget it. We're not going to say, okay, we got it simplified, you're covered for 20 years, we'll see 20 years from now. We think you need, unlike Redmond that's kind of tuned to do this maybe every six years, we're going to recommend every three so that we're, we're taking our own pulse regularly. But What's simplified is we're not taking the pulse of every applicant every time they walk in the door. That's what you're doing now, okay? And I'm going to show you how you can protect your level of service and still ask the question, do we have the capacity to serve that? And I'm going to have that in just a couple more slides, okay? So it seems like as I've listened to the questions and uh, the discussion that there's a, an important assumption that uh, uh, a lot of what you're saying is based on that and that assumption is that our transportation improvement plan if imp fully implemented would fix our mobility problems that's correct that is a key assumption and the reason that we believe it to be true it's not an article of faith it's not a, a matter of some religion we've joined it's a matter of getting unless it's technology religion it's taking your traffic model and letting it take all of your growth, 
and run it up and down all of your intersections and through all of your streets. And then when you add in all the future development that's in your plan, including Central Issaquah planning, you say, what falls apart? We've done a close correlation of all of your level of service analysis of every intersection. We got from CH2 hundreds of intersections. We've correlated that to the improvements that you've got. And we're down to two or three that we haven't got a fix for, and they may be unfixable. And so we may have to create exemptions in levels of service or change the level of service for those specific ones, or we may have to invent a new solution for them. But we're not <coughs> great risk here. We are not pie in the sky saying, oh, trust us, your level of service will somehow magically be maintained despite serious increases in density. Uh, it, quite to the contrary. We're using the best scientific tools you have and using them to check. We're doing the proof ahead of time. And in a couple more slides, I'm going to show you the sequence that that goes through and how we know that. Okay? Well, that's uh, comforting in a way because if I understood what you just said, uh, what you just said was uh, you've looked at our transportation improvement plan, you've evaluated uh, each of our intersections and, uh, and other problems with respect to mobility, uh, 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 walking, non-motorized, uh, uh, motorized, uh, transportation and transit, and uh, tested our transportation improvement plan and it sounds like there are a couple of cases where that needs to be tweaked a little bit. Yes, that is what I'm saying. That's what, what, what I heard you say, and I tell you, it's... Uh, can, 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 can I close the remark and then take your question with, with, with a, unless this sounds too good to be true comment, okay? Because um, it, feels, it feels really good, but what we're going to get to full disclosure about two or three slides after those two or three slides is it ain't cheap. Okay, we're going to talk about not only how expensive your TIP is, but we're going to get fairly specific about what that would look like in the form of mitigation fees for the fair share to charge development. There's a huge piece we are not allowed to charge them. I'll get to that. And we're going to talk about how expensive it is for the city to pay its share. Because to me, if there is ever a reason for the council to question whether to go forward with all of this, it will be when we talk money and we find out how much you have to charge taxpayers, how many grants you have to win, and how high the mitigation fees have to be. And at that point, if you say, is there another strategy, that's when we can suggest to you we could revisit the plan. We could do fewer improvements. What does that do to the level of service? You could change the level of service. What does that do to the improvement? So we have the ability to have that conversation. But rather than having everything up for grabs tonight, we wanted to start with something you have some real ownership in for a good reason. You've had a lot of community input to those plans. We think it's a good place to start. Thanks for letting me be a little long-winded. Sure. Um, good information. I didn't hear tweak. I heard there were three things that we didn't have answers to that we need to still figure out. So I just want to make that make that clear. That's what I. And they may be substantial and not tweak type answers. And as we go down this, I don't know tonight. I'm, are we going to learn what those are tonight, or is that? I wasn't going to get into the specific intersections tonight. I, I'm hoping to cover a lot of other ground on are we headed in the right direction about simplifying? And then that is one of several things that we're writing down from your comments. Make sure our team's got answers for the next workshop or before we come back with the next recommendation. Okay. We expect a lot of details that we're aware of that we don't plan on getting into tonight because you haven't given me four hours. I'm jealous. You gave Torsten three hours. I've spoken to him <laughs> harshly about this. Okay. Um, next time it's my turn. Uh, so le let me, when please are, go ahead. When will, be, when will we have access to the, to the, the data then? Do you to, know? To, to the three places that, on, that are not working well, and that, all the rest of that? Sure. I think there's a lot of more information than that. I think that's... Oh, clearly. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm going to give you some overviews of costs and projects tonight, and you're going to go, show me more. This is, you know, this is scaring me, and it's whetting my appetite. You know, I'm, as a council member, I'm not ready to vote on any of this. That's why we have work sessions like this to increase your comfort zone, to increase our understanding of what more you need to know before you're ready to make final decisions. So this, this, for me, this session's working great. I love the interruptions. They're not. They're good questions that we need to be aware of. 
and I'm counting on Trish to keep an eye on me because I'm not a good note taker. And, and as we see stuff like this, the, the specific points. I'm just if, fascinated if, by And Dave, the two of you, if you can be my, my helpers with. Joe? I'm just curious. You know, I've, I've seen the TIP over the years. And the TIP basically is a let's carry it over, let's carry it over, let's carry it over. It seems to me with that kind of a document, you, you don't have any real fresh ideas in it all the time. We're basing this whole system on, on at least a 15-year program that 80% that of it has been carried over each year. It, it would seem to me that somewhere along the line there ought to be new technology, new things, something outside of this that would, would tend to improve something along the way. And it also seems to me that it's kind of like garbage in, garbage out. If your TIP is only looking at a specific thing and they're not looking at the big items that are going to do more bang for your buck, you're going to come up with the same answer. How do we look at the TIP and get more bang for our buck going in so maybe we can get a better answer coming out? A um, couple of comments. First, you're absolutely right that the history of TIPs has been we couldn't afford it in the last five-year plan, maybe we can afford it in the next. So that's a lot of why we roll it over. It isn't so much a lack of fresh thinking. It's just we never got around to fixing the stuff we knew we needed to fix. Then there is the lack of fresh thinking. But I would suggest to you that Issaquah's TIP in recent years is getting better in that regard. I'm seeing projects now in current TIP that weren't there a few years ago that are serious investments in your central Issaquah plan. Okay? And so I'm not prepared tonight to pull up a slide with the whole list. But, but I'd like to at least assert that we're doing a little better. The other thing is, one reason we think that this needs to be revisited every three years <clears throat> is because we need a fresh, in, you, you need to do the TIP every year, but this whole simplified concurrency and mitigation needs a fresh injection of what is happening with technology, what, what's going on with improved and different transit systems and, and, uh, and bicycle and, and pedestrian. So let me take a stab at showing you Concurrency and mitigation simplified, not in 30 parts, in three, okay? The first part is all the review for concurrency will consist of a single, simple, lookup table capacity review. I'm going to show you specific spreadsheets that do that work that we have in place in Shoreline that we can develop to put in place here. I've been working with Torsten on how that can be done, okay? But for now, before I get into each of these three, let me share you what, what, with you what the other two pieces are. These are the only three things developer small and developer large will have to go through, okay? And the second one is, in fact, just for developer large. There will be a review that is not level of service and project driven. It will merge your current SEPA review and traffic study into a single study of safety and access adjacent to the development site. We're not going to go looking through the whole traffic model for every intersection that might blow up that maybe we didn't know was going to blow up because we didn't know that you were on the northwest corner instead of the southwest corner. Okay? We're going to trust our plan for a period of three years to be approximately right instead of being exactly wrong because that's the dilemma you're in now. You're very exact and you're wrong. Okay? It's not you individually. Your process is identifying highly specific things that in the aggregate are probably bad representations or put entirely on the back of a specific developer with no opportunity for them to share those costs with anybody else. There is a better way. We're going to show you how that works. The third part is to join all of this, not to let mitigation sit out there independently, but to have the payment system married to the concurrency system so that every development pays its proportionate share. You don't use SEPA and the micro concurrency analysis to say, aha, you blew up that intersection, fix it all. Lots of luck collecting some money from somebody else on that. Instead, we need you to pay for a piece of that and a piece of everything else. It's going to look and act and behave like your current impact fee system. And I'll explain how we get there and why it works in a minute. But these are your three pieces of simplified concurrency and mitigation. So let's go through each of the three one at a time. The first one, the concurrency capacity review, <clears throat> is going to pose a couple of questions and then compare the answers. Question number one will be, how many trips 
how many multimodal trips is your development going to put on our network? Okay. In a minute, I'll say I'll, I'll just say now that does not require a traffic <coughs> study. It requires just the applicant's drawings. Okay. How many square feet? How many dwelling units? They already know walking in the door. Tell us, we can answer this question for you. And next question will be. How many multimodal trips do we in the city of Issaquah have to serve that number that you need in A? Okay. We are not going to have to run the traffic model every time to see whether or not we have enough trips to say yes to you. Okay. We're going to have a concurrency bank, a trip bank, and I'll show you what that looks like. And then we're going to compare the two. It's just like if you have a bank account okay, and you've got $80 in it, and you're going out and you need to buy $100 worth of groceries, you have a problem. That's what concurrency is all about. If they need 100 trips and you've got 80, they have a problem. Our job is to make sure that the bank is accurate, that the balance is correct, that it's sustained, and that it's always positive. That's the key to economic development strategies is always having trips available. But it costs money. I'm going to keep coming back to but it costs money. Somebody's going to have to pay for those trips, okay? The hard part isn't the level of service. The hard part is the paying for it part. So let's break down these three steps and see what they look like if in a, in a simplified environment. Let's take the first one. How many trips do we have? Or I'm, excuse me, how many trips is, is your development going to, to bring to us? Um, those of you who have seen me in front of you before talking about impact fees, and particularly traffic impact fees, or who have sat through any of the level of service discussion, know that there is this national data bank called ITE, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and they have excruciatingly detailed trip generation rates, okay? And the bad news is they're wrong for Issaquah. The good news is they're right for everybody. Issaquah doesn't have its own. Nobody has their own. We all default to these, and then we say, developer, if you think that your daycare center has way fewer trips than the national daycare center thing, Hire yourself a traffic consultant, bring it to us, we can look at it. But don't bring it in scribbled on the back of a cocktail napkin. It needs to meet the same methodological rigor that we're relying on from the national data source. What I've got up here is a hypothetical application. I've got three different things being built. Imagine this is a multi-use development in central Issaquah. And they're going to do some apartments and a little bit of office and a little bit of retail. Okay? That, you could imagine that, right? And it would be actually a pretty nice fit for some of your central Issaquah plants. Now, in the real world, we're not limited to those three. Imagine that the left-hand column had 50 or 100 different land uses. You want to do a gas station? We've got one for gas stations. Retail, we've got up there. But what about restaurants? How about fast food restaurants, different the quality? We've we got them all, okay? For today, we just pick three good fits for you. But we can, we can meet the needs of any applicant walking in the door. And we'll have a list of what are you building, and then we have our standard trips per unit column. This is the stuff from the national data set. So the national data set says if you build an apartment, we expect you to generate 0 0.6, 0 0.62, 62% of a trip during the PM peak hour from that apartment. Okay? And for office, for every 1,000 square feet, you're going to generate 1.5, 1.49 trips per 1,000 square feet. That's the employees, the customers, and everybody else. And for retail, it's 3.75 trips per 1,000 square feet. Just think about that. It makes sense that retail is going to have more trips than offices because offices have got, you know, may maybe a doctor's office has got a bunch of people coming and going. But, you know, the CPA's office, the lawyer's office, not so many. The retail, they're not going to last long if they don't have lots of people coming and going. So what we've done is the first two columns are standard columns. Okay. They exist in a simple spreadsheet that the city of Issaquah will have. You can put it on your website. Anybody can use it anytime they want. But when it's time for an official application, they bring their drawings in, and they're going to help us fill out the third column, the applicant's number of units. So this is my hypothetical. Imagine the XYZ Corporation wants to build a 32-unit apartment building and 13,500 square feet of office and... 5,400 square feet of retail, okay? You can imagine a building that would look like that, that would fit in Central Issaquah, that would do all those things. All they have to do is give us those three numbers, no traffic study, we're done. The spreadsheet fills in the right-hand column. 
oh, guess what? 0 0.62 times 32 apartments is a total of 20 trips that you're going to generate from your apartments. Hmm, 1.49 times 13,500. Oh, what a coincidence. It's another 20 trips. I did this on purpose. I wanted you to see that three very different developments each generate, ironically, exactly the same number of trips. But we could have did another different model that was all office or all doctors or all apartments or wildly different. The point of this exercise is in five minutes, well, in 30 seconds after the applicant has given us the 32, the 13.5, and the 5,400, we have an answer for them. You're going to hit our system with 60 trips. Real quick question, just intuitively, I'm not going to quarrel with the, you know, 0 0.6214 dies from, you know, national data, but it just seems odd intuitively that an office, you know, that size, 13,000 square feet, I mean, 60 p.m. peak trips just from all these uses combined, if you had an office that big that employed, you know, 80 people, you're going to probably be generating 70 plus p.m. peak trips, you know, especially if it's multimodal, um, you're going to have people taking the bus, you're going to have people driving in and out of the office. But, you know, I just think of my office and the number of people that leave at between, you know, 5 and 6 p.m. Uh, coming out of that parking lot. I mean, it's way more than 60 people, so. But, but, but in 13,500 square feet, 80 employees would be about 20 square feet apiece. That's too small. You haven't allowed enough space for the office. What I'm suggesting is you're on the right track but I don't see this space having 80 employees. It's probably got more like 20 to 30. So what I'm driving at is, is there any consideration for the, I mean, you mentioned like fast food retail versus other retail. Is, is there more of a breakdown for the type of business we're dealing with? We're not just saying office. Yes, but, okay. Yes, there are more categories than the three simple ones I've given you up here. We have apartments in buildings more than 20 stories, apartments in two-story buildings. We have a lot of breakdown. But just so you don't get mad at me later, we don't have all the possibilities you can think of. We have a nationalized data set that's got maybe two or 300 of these. And then what we do is we have a provision that says to any applicant, if you don't find us on your list, bring us your number. Again, not scribbled on the back of a cocktail napkin. Bring it with a licensed engineer's stamp on it that says this is a valid study of a similar property that's different than what you folks have. You need to plug this in here. And, and we would allow that. So. We've now answered the first question, and we've done it. All the work is done by the applicant before they walk in our door. When they sat down with their architects, did their renderings and their blueprints, and figured out what their development looks like, and how many square feet, and how many development units, we just need for them to tell us that. And we would also have this on the website that they could look at and mess with before they even get to us. From when they walk in the door and we fill in those three numbers, probably not even 30 seconds, we know how many trips. So we've simplified that part, no traffic study. What are we going to do to make sure we can handle the 60 trips? That's the other part. That's going to lead to our trip bank. Okay? We're going to create like a bank account, just like you can't overdraft your bank or you shouldn't. We're going to have mechanisms so you can't overdraw this. But how do we get to a beginning balance? What's our initial deposit in the Bank of Issaquah trip bank? Okay? We turn to our traffic model that has been validated against actual traffic counts on the ground. So it's really good at understanding how many trips you have and how many you're going to have. Okay? Your current traffic model tells me that in the year 2030, I'm at the top line, the total number of trips we expect on <coughs> the entire network is a total of 45,000 trips. Okay? I'm rounding here, but it's, a, it's, it's within 10% of that number, the exact number that I got from Torsten for the work I'm doing updating the impact fee. So if we know that in the year 2030, we're going to have 45,000 trips, and if, I'm going to come back to this and really hammer it on it, it's a point you've been making to me, if we have a, a network of improvements that will allow those 45,000 trips to enjoy your level of service, so it isn't just 45,000 trips stuck in traffic, 45,000 trips at your level of service, okay? 45,000 in the future, how many have we got now? Well, we got traffic counts, and the answer is about 30,000. If you subtract them, there's only one possible explanation. We don't need to detect it. It's growth, okay? It isn't all growth in Issaquah, because these trips include traffic that flows through, okay? That's a major issue for you. 
and trips that start here and end elsewhere or start elsewhere and end here. So this is the whole trip picture. And when we get done, we're going to focus on the internal trips, which is the one you can control. But for simple math, if we're going to have 45,000 and we can serve them, and we have 30 now, we have the ability to serve the other 15,000. So that's our future minus current. But guess what? We can't give away all 15,000 of those. We already sold, gave away, contracted, development agreement, mitigated. One way or another, we've made promises. We can't change them. So we're going to have to look up our committed trips to approve development, stuff that we've already said yes to. We may have done a brilliant job. We may have done an inept job. But we can't undo that job. So we're going to subtract however many trips we have committed to other development that hasn't built yet, because we can't give those away. They're just not on our network right now. Subtract the 4,000, and now the Bank of Issaquah Trip Bank is open for business with a beginning balance of 11,000 trips. Okay? I said we we're going to make concurrency simple. We have a little homework to do to get this bank constructed. Okay? Torsten has to give us the exact numbers, and we need to do it for internal trips only. And staff is going to have to do a serious amount of work figuring out the list of all those approved developments and how many trips we gave to them and how many of those are internal trips. Did I mention we're going to include multimodal trips in all of this? This is why it can happen faster than 18 months, but it's not going to be a week from Tuesday. Okay? We need a little homework time to get this developed. But when it's done, to you and the applicant, we did all that homework. All the projects we needed to deliver level of service for those 45,000 trips is in the model going to be back to, did we pay for those? Okay. And so we can afford to say yes to 11,000 trips. So now let's go back to our hypothetical development. We got 11,000. They only had 60 they needed. Boy, did we just say yes. That was the easiest concurrency in the world. Now the bank balance is 10,940. And we just keep this going until we get down to zero. Wrong. We will build a cutout into this that if it gets down to less than 10%, less than 50%, less than some number, will require an update even if it isn't our every three year update that we're planning on. So that you'll never overdraft. This is your ultimate overdraft protection. We won't allow development to be approved until we've done the update. We think every three years will be enough. So I'm interested in how we get to the 45,000 um, in 2030. So based on what? And I don't know that you have, I don't expect that you have a uh, Detailed explanation for that. I'm sure there's lots that's that. The, that's the yeah, that that we have total 45,000 trips. Yes, the current traffic model. When you load into it all the development that you have in your comp plan out to the year 2030. So all the buildings, all the population, all the houses that you say are going to happen is in that model. Just overloading the traffic like crazy, and then we found out what broke and your TIP was then loaded into the model to fix it, and that's where all but three intersections got fixed in my recollection. And so we're serving 45,000 trips in the year 2020 at your level of service, asterisk those three that we gotta fix, and so we've protected your level of service. But how do we know what we're gonna have built in 2030? All of it. You, so th every, that, so that's why we're gonna talk about the money. Okay. The, the, that's the three hundred twenty thousand that, dollars. That, that, three hundred twenty million dollars. That's the three hundred twenty million dollars. So that's question. assuming we'll have forty-five thousand if we spend three hundred twenty million dollars by Correct. that time. Correct. I am definitely going to come back to that because the hardest question you're going to have isn't the level of service, it isn't the TIP, it isn't the plans you've already developed. It's what was that movie? Show me the money. Okay. If we can make it work, then we leave all of this alone, and you have a winner. If we can't make it work financially, it doesn't mean that simplified concurrency fails. It means that we re need to revisit the level of service and the project list and possibly some of the comp plan. Okay? That will be painful and hard. But that is the other way we can do it and not say, well, we just have to charge $50,000 a trip for mitigation fees and raise our taxes, you know, 50%. Okay? But I'm coming to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get much more specific about the funding part. So this is, we have, we have a three-part concurrency system. This is part one, okay? Come in, applicant, give me your drawings, fill in the blank how many square feet, how many development units. 30 seconds later, we know how many trips you need, and a minute later, we know whether we got them or not. End of concurrency. Nothing get much simpler than that, okay? 
with the huge caveat, did we pay for the projects? We'll come into that, right? So how can this be so simple? You've actually already gotten from me some of the points on this slide, but I want to say them again because repetition is good for the memory, and I'll probably say it just a little bit differently. The first thing is the traffic model that you have right now, and Dan was just validating that for us, or verifying it, giving me an amen on that, that all of the growth that's in your comp plan is in that model. We didn't go, oh, well, we won't tell the council we left this part out. We think they're wrong. We don't think it's going to happen. It's all in there, okay? The growth forecast that you agreed to as part of the state hand-me-down from OFM to the region, to the Central Puget Sound Regional Council allocation down to Issaquah's piece, and you agreed to that, and you've got have a, that number of houses and apartments and jobs, that's in your plan, that's in this model, okay? And that model has all the projects that the model said are required to fix all everything that would break when you take that much development in. Except the, the asterisk about the three that we got to re revisit. So that's the first reason that concurrency can be simple is because you've already got a planning tool, the traffic model, that is completely accepting your growth forecasts and has figured out what needs to be fixed. That's the $350 million problem we're going to come to. The second reason it can be so simple is the traffic model, by plugging those fixes in, is run again, and that's where we show that the level of service is, in fact, acceptable. So we don't just hope that it worked. We run the model another time, and all the red lights turn to green. You know, all the things that broke are fixed, except for those three. And then we can say, therefore, that our level of service, the growth trips are going to get the level of service, and therefore concurrency is achieved. The only reason that isn't the end of the story is we're going to call it Randy's caveat, okay? It depends on payment. It depends on growth paying their share and you paying your share. The reason you can't get growth to pay all of it is not only because it would be wildly uncompetitive, it would also be illegal, okay? We're only allowed to charge growth for their share of this, and we're going to talk about what their share is in a minute which means there's a share for you, which is bigger than you expected, and it's real expensive. So this is how we can get to concurrency as a simplified matter. Now let's talk about the second piece of our concurrency, our simplified uh, mitigation system. This is a one-slide wonder. This takes no complexity. This is where we take two of your other three tools, SEPA and the traffic study or traffic impact analysis, and we go, we're not doing it that way anymore. We're still going to only require this of large-scale development, currently 30 trip PM peak power trips or more. That's, that could be discussed whether that should be changed, but we're going to stick with what you have. But only those folks are going to have to do this extra study, but they don't have to do a traffic study that goes into the traffic model. We don't do a traffic model run to check for intersections that blow up. We're going to look within literally a stone's throw of their property and find out if they put the driveway here instead of 50 feet farther here, what does that do to the, st the storage in the stack lanes for the turn, okay? And um, what about safety? You know, are, are, by, by, by exiting your property here instead of 20 feet further, are we creating a, a conflict problem that we can solve? That's all we want in these micro studies is are you being safe? Can we get your customers and your, your employees in and out of your business? That's it. And now we're ready for the payment part of it. And we're talking about making this simpler and more understandable, but it is not pain-free because nothing is free when you come to paying for expensive road projects. We're going to talk about the payment of the proportionate share. These are things that are already underway. You contracted with me last year to start updating your 2006 road impact fee. It's not old enough that we'll get anything for it on eBay. It's not really an antique, but it's in need of update. Okay? And we're, we're making really good progress on that. Also, two years ago, <coughs> You engaged us to start thinking about and working on a multimodal mitigation fee like the one that we've done for Seattle. Okay? It's going to be SEPA driven because the Growth Management Act does give, doesn't give us the authority to do this. But you're the poster uh, city for doing SEPA based mitigation fees, um, much more um, thoughtful and detailed than most other cities. Other cities are following in your footsteps for your government facilities mitigation fee. I did that. I know how, how we got there. Uh, for your law enforcement mitigation fee. And all I've said to the, to the staff team and to your attorney is, 
We're going to do the same thing. We're going to do it now for bike and ped and transit. Right? And we're well underway, and I have some rough numbers to share with you about that. And then you've asked for simplifying the payment itself. So not only is it a lookup table of how much you owe, and there isn't anything else you owe. There isn't going to be another concurrency run of the model to see if you blew up an intersection. You pay this, you're done. Okay? And we'll merge those payments into write a single check. We'll do the bookkeeping of parsing this money to that account and that money to this account. Okay? What's that look like? Well, let's start with what you've got right now for impact fees. Then we're going to talk about the update of impact fees. And then we're going to talk about this multimodal mitigation fee. What you're looking at is what you have today. I wrote this for you in 2006. With Torsten's help, he was doing the traffic modeling behind all of my work. We found that you had a then current TIP of about $100 million, $111 million. And we found $88 million of those projects that could be eligible for impact fees. So the other $30 million, $23 million is stuff that there's no, there was no growth connection at all. And every TIP is like that. You have some things that don't have anything to do with development. And so we had $88 million that we could charge to grow, and we had 18,000 trips we saw coming. This, these numbers are right out of the adopted study. It's in, on your website. It's in my files. Um, and so you divide $88 million. Those of you who've got pocket calculators or are really good with numbers in your head, divide $88 million by 18275 and you better get $4,839 per trip. That's what we're charging right now. Okay? That is your current mitigation fee. That's your impact fee. Now, by charging that, we need to earn the $88 million, and we really need to earn the whole $111 million to make this work. Well, below the black line, it says growth share of the cost is $47 million. Why isn't that $88 million? If, if I say that growth, the 18,000 trips, is responsible for the $88 million, why am I not showing $88 million in revenue coming back to you? It's because out of those 18,000 trips, about 9,000 of them are our trips, and we're going to get them to pay us $4,800. And the other 9,000 are the trips that come through here, but we don't get to charge for them. We could erect, the toll road, we could erect a toll road. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the toll booth. Yep, that's, it was turned down once. Yeah. <laughs> we might have to go back to it. <laughs> Um, so what it means is, out of our $111 million, if growth pays us $47 million, we still need Issaquah to pay $67 million, okay? Now, there's a problem with the $47 million because you're not getting all of it, okay? We're giving credits. I'm going to come back to that. Not always credits for the same thing that we're charging the impact fees for, and that might not be the right thing to be doing, okay? And some cities are out there... Uh, in their development agreements agreeing to charge less because they're accepting traffic models provided by the applicant instead of the city's traffic model and they're getting snookered for it. So I can't tell you that you're going to actually balance the books on this, but now, okay, smelling salts, everybody got your smelling salts? Got your nitro pills ready? Okay. This is a draft, okay, and it's okay if it's in tomorrow's headlines because it isn't the real number, but it's really close to real numbers. These are not just made up hypothetical. We've gone through your TIP and have identified $308 million worth of projects that net of other funding appear to be eligible for impact fees, and 291 of that $308 million has a growth component to it. So, yeah, if you're doing the math, we've more than tripled, quadrupled the, the eligible projects. And growth didn't go up. It actually went down a little bit. Okay. That's because the 2006 number was done back when we were using the old growth forecast, when before the Great Recession we thought growth was forever. Now we're still expecting growth. Issaquah is not going to stop growing, but it's not going to grow as fast. This is, again, out of your traffic model, out of your updated in, uh, population forecast. So $290 million divided by 15000 you notice the slight difference between the $4,800 a trip and the $19,000 a trip? Now, some of you know that I am the author of the City of Sammamish's Transportation Impact Fees, which holds the current Guinness Book of Records for the state of Washington for the highest transportation impact fee in the state. If this stays in place, 
you will knock them off the pedestal. I don't know if you want to do that or not. And I don't know if we can defend it. And I don't know if you can afford to pay the city share of this. That's why we're having this conversation and beginning your thinking processes about it. But you could be looking in draft version at an impact fee that would uh, quadruple from 4,800 to 19,000. Okay? And if we do that, it doesn't raise 291 million. It only raises 145 million. Remember all those trips that start in Seattle and end in North Bend or the other way around? Or they start in Issaquah, but they end in Tukwila? Or they start in Redmond and they end in Issaquah? We only get the Issaquah piece of all those trips. And we, the city, and our taxpayers, and our grantors, and anything else we can think of have to pay the rest of it. There is, under Washington law, a way for us to enter into reciprocal agreements for other impact fees, but they've been wildly complicated, not terribly successful, highly political. So I don't recommend that as our solution. So we need to find $163 million, and we need to agree to charge $19,000, $400 a trip. We got a winner. And if those numbers are feeling uncomfortable, we can still do simplified, but you're going to have to revisit the project list, the levels of service, and that's okay too, okay? But for getting through tonight's presentation, we're going to assume that we can come back to you and present ideas for the $163 million, and that we're going to address the question of what would we want to do if we didn't want to charge $19,400 for an impact fee. So, Randy, so in reality, what you're saying is the... 19.4 reflects our current comp plan and our current TIP list. And, and your so current central Issaquah plan. Central Issaquah. And so the 48.39 is what we're charging now. So the balance right. there is either is either an externality, because nobody's paying it, or it's, and essentially the externality is on the public. Yes. It's coming on the city. That's right. So it is, it is uh, that is the gap in revenue or the charge that is being, in a sense, charged to the public even though the public isn't necessarily paying for that cost right now based on what the fee is. Correct. Some of it's paid by grants, so that's the public indirectly. The, it's money we send to Olympia and then get back or send to Washington, D.C. and then get back. But some of it could very much be street fund money, other local dollars that we put to work, real estate excise tax money, things that are, are local dollars. And as we look at that $163 million and go, wow, that's a big number that we have to swallow, we're already swallowing hard. We're supposed to be paying the $64 million in the middle column. Okay? And we're only paying part of it, which is why we're having trouble with the project rolling over from one TIP to the next. We haven't had the money to do the job. So what does this teach us? Um, oh, first I want to talk about this new multimodal mitigation fee. I'm going to do a short version of what we just did for transportation. We have a draft. We see nine projects. And you're going, what? Our Central Issaquah mm -hmm. plan had way more than nine projects that was going to help bike and pedestrian. Yes. And those that are part of a street project are in the street project list, part of the 300 million. This 41 million is for the projects that are only bike and ped. And we have no way to justify them under Washington law as a transportation impact fee. So we're going to build them instead into our 3M fee, MMM, multimodal mitigation fee. So that's going to be my shorthand, 3M fee. Yeah, I've, uh, I've already been challenged by a company back in Wisconsin or Minnesota. So we've got nine projects for $41 million. And bike and pedestrian trips, these are just bike ped trips. We're not transit investing right now. Okay, We're transit supportive, and we want to get to the 17% mode split. But we don't really have much, you as a city don't have much investment in transit support. They provide pretty much everything except the... Uh, almost random, you know, queue jump or bus pull out or, you know, even the shelters they pay for most of. So until that changes, until you decide to make an investment in transit supportive, I have nothing to charge for. So I'm just charging for the bike ped trips, which at 7% is not your current, it's where you want to be in your central Issaquah plan for bike and ped. Okay? So we're going to say that 7% of motorized trips is a number that will let us approximate the number of bike and ped trips. We've, we've, we've made that a reliable study in both our work for the city of Portland, Oregon in 1997 and updated in 2007, and then more recently that we've done for the city of Seattle. It's a, it's a good rule of thumb number. So if, if, if you put 100 trips, motor, motorized trips on the road, we would expect you to put seven bike ped trips on the sidewalks and bike lines, okay, as a, as a rule of thumb for this rough, rough math, okay? Can we just quickly say the number 17% is out there in the central plan, so this is just bike and peds, the other 10% number comes from? From transit. Right. 
And if we had transit projects in the 41 million, we'd have the other 10% of the trips. Okay? So if I've got $41 million, 7% of the trips, that turns out to be 1,200 trips. That's 7% of the uh, 45,000, okay? Or of the 15,000 of growth, growth trips. And if I have $41 million and 1,200 trips, that's $3,400 a trip. Just like we had the hundreds of millions divided by the 15,000, now we've got 41 million divided by 1,200. So these are our two mitigation fees. And this is what it would look like to make this a single pay and go system for our example. Remember the 32 apartments and the 13,000 square feet and the 5,400 square feet? They would pay an impact fee on their 60 trips of a million one. They would pay a mitigation fee on four trips. All right, that's 7% of 60 trips. So it's only going to cost them 14,000. Total bill, a million 178. That's paying for everything. Everything. So let me let me just offer one more thought, and then we'll go to the comments and questions. This means you do have to charge nineteen thousand dollars a trip. But do the math with me. Thirty-two apartments at, if they were condos, they'd be worth at least two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand. Stop me when I get to the number you think it is. Let's just say three hundred thousand. Okay, that's over nine million dollars of construction cost, and then. About 20,000 square feet combined to the office and the retail at $100 a square foot, 150, 175, 200, okay, 200. There's another $2 million. So I've got a project that's costing, you know, 12, 14 million dollars. Is this a lot of money? Yes. Is this enough money to make them go somewhere else? Not if you've got the right plan. Not if you're the place they want to be. Not if you've got the the, the, the workforce and the access to the interstate and all the other things that you have to offer, this doesn't drive them away. And anybody who thinks that impact fees drive people away needs to remember that we've got 78 cities in the state of Washington charging impact fees, almost all of them <coughs> charging transportation and parks, and none of them have seen development stop. So impact fees don't stop development. Asking development to pay its fair share, its full fair share, when it can see it coming, the only development that gets grumpy is my late uncle, who used to live in Fall City and build one-at-a-time houses in North Bend and Fall City. That man who taught me everything I know about power tools and who I miss a lot, and you're not supposed to have favorite uncles, but he was my favorite uncle, that's going to kill him. Okay? So we need to think about what this does for really small-scale development. But this isn't going to take the national home building companies and drive them away, okay? nor the high-end custom small home builders. They're going to grumble. They're going to show up at city council and go, we really hate this. And then they're going to build the house and pass the cost along. And when the total bill only adds 10% and it's predictable, there isn't a surprise, oh, we found an intersection that you have to fix for $350,000. Okay? This, this adds predictability that is worth a lot. Uh, so I have a question, and I just want to say, Randy, I think your presentation tonight is outstanding. Um, Thank you. I just want to say that. Um, we have a number of projects in the city, well, more than just projects, entire areas that are subject to development agreements. And I take it that that development was all included in the model uh, for future growth, because it's obviously development within the city limits. Those areas that have come under those development agreements are vested, at least my understanding, almost all of them, if not all of them, are vested to current code when it comes to traffic impact fee yep. payments. Yep. So essentially it was based on a you know, $4,800 uh, per trip analysis. Right. By adding all of that development into the model, but having it already been paid for by the developer who's subject to the DA, isn't this putting a higher disproportionate share on other developers who didn't get a development agreement? No. It's putting a higher disproportionate share on the back of the taxpayers. Because I'm not allowed by law, and I will, I will pick at your city hall if you yeah. try and charge the new developer for the piece we didn't capture from the old developer. It's illegal. The statute requires us to charge them only their proportionate share. Another phrase in the statute, it has to be the amount reasonably needed by them. 
A third requirement is the amount that we spend has to be reasonably benefit them. Those terms are not just plain English, you know, dictionary stuff. They have very formal legal meanings. And so this is the maximum number, 19,400, that you can charge new development that you haven't previously agreed to. So one of the rocks you've turned over that is part of our work plan to figure it out is the 145 million that we could get if all the future trips paid that, we're going to find, that's why our trip bank finds the 4,000 trips we've already given away. We're also going to find out how much money we're getting from that. And the difference between how much they're going to pay and 19,400 moves from the 145 million to the 163 million. I'm not sure I like that answer. Um, <laughs> I wasn't real pleased giving it. Um, no, I appreciate it. But it is how the law works, okay? Which ultimately means that if the 163 million becomes, let's say, 180. And if we couldn't get to 163 and we definitely can't get to 180, we may be coming back to the project list and the level of service and the plans. But I didn't want to start there because you have a lot of value in those plans. You've worked hard to get there. And we at least owe you the opportunity to see well, how could we pay for it? Is it just stupid, ridiculous we can't get there? Or are there some painful ways to get there? and phasing in the strategies over a three to five year period, we can make it work. It needs to be, that's why you ran for office to be able to make these policy decisions. It's why your technical team of staff and consultants doesn't make those decisions. We make presentations and give you choices, and then we get to watch you squirm with the hard choices of which one are we gonna I guess do? As, as a follow-up to that then, I mean, is, are you assuming as part of this that the impact fees or whatever, whatever it is we're calling it, the fees, yes. um, are essentially paying for all of those TIP projects, or is there any assumption that the city would find other money to assist in paying with those projects? Okay. So the $308 million, that's the TIP, minus the $41 million that's sitting over in the multimodal category. That's the $350 million total, okay? So $308 million that's just roads or sidewalks and bike paths that are part of roads. So we're paying, we have to pay the whole 308 million. When we get down to the black numbers, add 145 to 163, it's 308, okay? In order to get 145, we need all those 15,000 growth trips to pay 19,000. But you've just pointed out why two or three or 4,000 of them aren't going to. That number is gonna come down. Even if it didn't come down, you have to find the other 163 million. Actually, when Dave introduced me, he reminded you I have to do that. I have to, I'm, I'm your detective. Part of our work plan for this is for me to come back to you and give you every funding strategy known to man, legal in the state of Washington, and how much you can generate from it, and how much it will cost each taxpayer. Um, I've taken, actually added a little fun. It's very little fun. Um, but the city of Fife is just rolling out our first version of a web-based game where you can go in and plug in the numbers to get to that total. and each time you plug in a number, it tells you how much closer you are to balancing the books, but it also tells you out to the side, you just charged a motor vehicle excise tax of 3%. You just charged a property tax of an average of $900 per house per year. So all the choices are expressed in, you know, the, the, the per employee, not head tax, but the per employee um, business license is now $85 per person, okay? So it'll be, it'll be something that I can develop for you so that you can do it won't be fun, but it'll be a way to do quickly see the immediate implications of all the possible scenarios. But a good example of that, I'm sorry, would be like the overcrossing, which is built into that. So that's yeah. a federal overcrossing. I don't remember how much it costs, $80 million or some yeah, 60, number yeah, 60, up there, 60, yeah. 60. And that's usually federal 80%, 20% state. And there might be some local charges there, but that's built into that okay. city share okay, city right share. city share okay. so another example would be the north issaquah lid you know there's there's city yeah. share there but a lot of that city share is being picked up through the assessment back to the businesses in right. that area yeah. so exactly. we got to be cognizant of that but that's not just going straight it's to not, the it's not not all real estate excise taxes that's correct yeah. <laughs> okay. well, so that's uh, this oh, oh, sorry didn't mean to move on i'll move back so that statement that in 194 we would be the highest in the state of Washington, yeah. that's a heck of a statement. Mm -hmm. So if we're an, if we'd be an outlier there, where where in this are we an outlier already? I mean, how do we arrive at the 
potentially being the least competitive city in the state of Washington? Well, first of all, impact fees don't make least competitive cities. That's the misunderstanding. We all treat impact fees like we treat buying gasoline for our cars. Oh, this station is eight cents a gallon less than that one. I'll make a U-turn and go around three blocks to get there to save eight cents a gallon. Land development decisions are not based on decisions that cost two or three percent of the property. Now, the development community, particularly the large national corporations, will give you with a straight face, swear on stacks of everything that is holy to them, but that's wrong. They will not come to your city, and if they're here, they will leave if you charge these. If that was true, no city with impact fees would ever collect a dime, okay? It's the highest growth communities, not just in Washington, but in the United States, that have the highest impact fees, and they're still growing. Why? Because A, it's predictable, and B, it's buying something. It's not a high tax, and the corporation can't see the benefit. It's an investment in the streets they need, and for other infrastructure, the parks that they want, the school system, the fire station, okay? There's value in return for that. So any economic development officer for a corporation worth their salt will huff and puff and you know, turn blue in the face saying they're never coming to Issaquah if you adopt even half of that, okay? On the other hand, Sammamish, you've noticed, hasn't stopped growing. They're working on their town center plan. They're the, they're the ones with the record that's not that much below 19.4. They're at 16.5 and they've been there for five years, okay? So would you be the outlier? Yes. Will it stop development? No. Will you get noises like it's gonna stop development? Yes. You know, will Costco come to the table and go, wow, you know, we might have to move to Chicago. Well, okay, we're gonna to have to have that conversation. They're gonna to have to have a lot of hard thinking about the investment they've already made and what this community is like and whether you've already, you know, are, are in good faith entering into negotiations that are going to deliver the transportation network they need. It's not your job to call their bluff. It's your job to help them say, we've made this so much faster, easier, and more predictable that at $12 a square foot for your property, I'm remembering what their request might be, it's not going to, you know, against the $200 a square foot cost. Grumpy, yes. Leave in town, it hasn't happened elsewhere. It's not what drives them. So let me pick up the pace a little. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Um, so I'm going to fast forward through a few of these slides. And so we've applied this. Oh, okay. So here's applying the whole simplified approach. We did that concurrency re review, step one, with our simple calculator of trips and our simple trip bank, and it worked. It was a big enough development that we made them do the special local analysis of safety and access. That was all. No more com model runs. And we calculated their proportionate share at a million dollars, which is way more than you or I make in a year, but in the context of an 11 or 12 or 15 million dollar building is not a deal killer. Okay? So it worked. So how can we get from here to the finish line on all this? How can these payments be so simple? I'm back to the point I made before that the projects are the ones in the traffic model that deliver the, the level of service, and that the model, the growth that's in the model is going to pay its proportionate share if we charge the 19400 So we get the level of service, and therefore, when they pay, they get concurrency if, there's that mean guy Randy again, pounding the table about the money, if you charge 194 if we find the $163 million, probably closer to $180 million after we do the, the previously committed trips. And when that happens, oh, well, let's say we don't want that. We're not ready to, let's, we don't want to be the outliers. How could we not pay the full amounts? Here's some ideas. This is pointing to other unnamed communities in western Washington. Um, some of them have adopted impact fee rates at lower than the proportionate share. When I came to you with the $4,600, you adopted the whole amount, okay? So you're not in this group. Now, if I come back to you at 19,004 and you go, oh, can I do 14.5? You know, we can talk, but then we got to reduce the project list, or we got to shift it to the taxpayers, or we got to reduce the level of service. There are ways out of it, and that's what some other cities have done. I've just charged less. You don't want to do that? There are some other cities who just said, well, how are they ever going to find out whether we paid the 163 million or not? You know, when does that get audited? Well, it turns out that the very first performance audit in this state, done by our state auditor was of impact fees. And the question was raised, are you folks spending the money and spending it on time and delivering the project? So this is no longer a, oh, you know, 
I'll drive fast and the cop won't see me going over the speed limit. You know, they're watching us now. So I'm worried about these cities that are playing this, the game this way of, oh, nobody will know. Because the when you'll know is when your own traffic model says, we didn't build those projects and we can no longer serve 45,000 new trips, we can serve 30,000. Or some cities are giving credits and saying, I got a list of 10 projects here, my impact fee is for those 10 projects, and you want to fix project number 11? Yeah, that's going to cost you 400000 I'll take it off of what you owe me. But what's wrong with that math is we still need to build the 10 projects. And we just reduced our pot of money to do that by $400,000. I mean, thank you very much for helping some part of the traffic system that we didn't say we needed. Okay? And, and some of these cities are actually giving credits for that. One of our strategies for you in streamlined uh, mitigation and concurrency is to revisit the definition of, of credits to make sure that we're being very clear about what we're giving credits for and what we're not. And then I need to comment about development agreements because one or two of you have raised questions about that. Um, development agreements in some cities are treated as sort of like the old TV program, let's make a deal. Okay? Um, and there's wheeling and dealing in the back room about credits and about traffic studies from other models and about other concessions. Let me help us understand what this is all about. Transportation concurrency is not like buying a new car. Anybody here ever bought a new car? Gone into the showroom? There's this neat new car you really wanted. There's a sticker on the, on the window. MSRP, Manufactured Suggested Retail Price. You know you're not going to pay that. The dealer knows you're not going to pay that. We're going to go in the back room and we're going to arm wrestle. You know, those of us who are not very good at it are going to get a hundred bucks off. Those of us who have all the resources and look it up and beat them up, you know, we might get a few thousand off, but we're going to make a deal. That's what some cities are doing with their transportation impact fees. Yeah, it costs $19,400, but for you, seventeen five. okay? The problem is what those cities should be doing is treating that negotiation like an applicant for utility services. Hi. I'm going to build 400,000 square foot office building, and I'm going to have employee uh, uh, lunch rooms with uh, um, uh, sinks in them, and uh, I'm going to have restrooms with faucets and toilets. Um, I'm going to have employee showers for the bicycle riders. I need water. How much? And our water utility says, your connection fee is X, and your cost per gallon is Y. And the applicant doesn't go, can we go in the back room and negotiate that? That isn't how it works. But we have applicants treating our transportation system that way because their traffic consultant can beat up our traffic consultant. They got a traffic model that says that it's a different number of trips in a different location. And we've been trapped in that because we're using our model to do site-specific analysis. If we go to simplified, all we care is you're putting 60 trips on our system, you owe me for 60 trips. The only thing you can do is to prove me to me that you're not, you don't have 60 trips. You're allowed to do that, but if you can't prove less than 60 trips, you need to pay for the 60 trips. Don't meet me in the back room. Okay? That's what's got me upset about those cities. So you could cut your full impact fees if you if they're still too high. That's very readable. You could cut you could increase revenue from other sources, or you can reduce the projects and levels of service. We've been talking about this a lot, so this is going to go kind of quickly. We could look for other money, grants, local taxes, bonds, LIDs that uh, Bob was talking about, um, you know, the 80-20 or better grant funding stuff. Some of that's already in there, but, you know, that's going to be my job in this update, in, this, in the simplified plan, is to give you a full $300 million financing strategy. And, but if you want, you can figure out other money and use that to further buy things down. Eventually, you're going to get to the taxpayers. That's the consequences in red because we're going to use up everybody else's money in a hurry, and we're going to start looking at local businesses paying the, it's not a head tax, business license fee, or stuff like that. So if you don't like raising money, you do have the other alternative. You go back to your plan, and you say level of service, D was too aggressive. In a high-density environment, we need to accept E, or in some circumstances, F, or G, or H, or whatever the lowest is. It is F. But, um, so the consequences are that if we do this, it takes all that good work you put into those plans and it makes you redo some of that work and rethink. You know, do we need that overcrossing? Is it, are we ready to spend $60 million to do that? How vital is that? And how much are we willing to spend and how much are we willing to charge others if we can't get others to pay for it? Um, so what's it going to take to get you from here to there? This is going to happen. You, you've been through three previous meetings on this. 
and you've heard a number of very smart people give you some early estimates about what it might take. And I'm lucky because I get to stand on their shoulders. They've helped you think about it might take a long time and it might cost a lot of money. They've allowed me to come to the table and say, first of all, share with me what they learned in going to Redmond. I'm aware of that system. It's not one of mine. It allowed me to share what I'm doing in Shoreline and other communities. And we've agreed that I get to be the one to deliver this message. We think it's way sooner than, in fact, we think it's early next year. I'm going to give you a more specific calendar in a minute. We also think that it's going to cost a whole bunch less. Early back of the envelope guesstimates, 300,000, 350,000. Those were good estimates to protect you if you had to do a whole bunch of multiple new models and a bunch of complicated software development. But what we've learned is we can build on your current model. We know what tweaks to make that aren't software brand name sensitive. We can build them into your um, uh, permitting system. Build on what we've learned in Redmond, Linwood, uh, Shoreline, and others. And so we're talking probably tops $100,000 to get from here to next um, April the 1st with a, a functional system. Now, we are going to tell you again and again and again, you can't park that system and let it run for you for 10 or 15 years. You're going to need to update it every two or three years. And that means Torsten and his folks are going to need 30 to 50,000 every two or three years to update the model. I'm going to need to update the traffic impact fees, or somebody is. You know, So that work is going to have to be done. But to get you from here to April the 1st, probably under $100,000. And by the way, we may need some of that out of this budget year. We're still, we haven't finished sharpening our pencils. We have not talked to your finance staff or to Bob about whether or not we're going to request some of the money be paid this year instead of next year. We don't even know if you have that as, as a budget amendment possibility. But, but we may be coming back to you and asking for part of that less than 100000 to be out of this year's budget and the rest of it out of next year's. And we don't need an interim system anymore because we can go straight to a workable final by next March the 1st, and, or, or March 31st. And this is a little bit more detailed calendar, and Dave said I had an even more detailed calendar. I'm not going to take your time to go through it, but I want everybody to have a copy. Um, and what we're saying is we're taking the general direction that you've given the, the staff in the previous three meetings, which is simplified sounds good figure out how to do it. And we're starting to take steps in that direction. And what we wanted tonight, and we got big time, is good questions. What about this and what about that? And something of an affirmation that the principles sound right, that we're protecting the level of service, we're going to get the transportation improvements. But if I'm you, I'm reserving the right to wait for the answers on how we're going to pay for this. Because I think that's the harder question and if we can't do it, then it does force us back to the plan. And with that, way beyond the time you gave me, I'm done. Thank you. I just wrote a question. Go right ahead. Um, Timing-wise, there, there's a large vote uh, in the early spring that would add a number of neighborhoods to the city. That could result in next year's TIP having more items on there. If the next update wouldn't occur for several years, doesn't that potentially skew the result? Because if you add more items to your TIP, but you don't add more growth trips, you would have a higher number than 19, whatever it is. So we're talking about annex an annexation? Right. Would it make sense to have an update in one year, given that unique situation? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to tell you yes, and then I'm going to tell you why Kirkland will tell you you don't have to. Okay? You may have heard that they had a little annexation about 50% increase in the population of the city. Um, we did some of the early annexation studies for Kingsgate and Juanita and, and Finn Hill. Um, and our advice to them was, rather than scrambling to do all this new study, welcome to our city. If you're going to develop in our city, you're going to come in and pull permits from us, and you're going to be subject to all of our normal review procedures and fees. So if we're charging $19,000 to every trip that comes through the door, those new trips will come through the door and also pay that until the update. So given that the update's not 10 years later, but it's one to two years later, in my opinion and in Kirkland's experience, you're probably safe not doing a mad scramble. And, and Torsten will be mad that I said that because otherwise you'd have to hire him to do the model. And I'll be mad that I said that because then you'd have to hire me to do the updates. 
but I think you're safe. I think you're, that you, Kirkland has been safe. They have not lost a huge opportunity because they did impose the current impact fees on the new development. Thank you. Other questions, uh, observations, comments, gaps in information that you believe was not covered today that would be helpful as we go forward? This is a work in progress. Uh, this is the fourth installment. I'm delighted to see that uh, what we thought it was going to cost appears to be significantly less, and the time that it was going to take to go through this process is going to be significantly less, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and a lot of questions that need to be answered and some tough decisions. But uh, uh, Randy, an excellent uh, presentation. I want to thank you for uh, laying it out, uh, laying the bad news out there, the worst case, or I hope that was the worst case. And so with that, if there are no further additions, do you have any uh, concluding comments, Dave? I would say that you have a schedule here. We oh, have to talk into this. <laughs> We have a schedule, it's, it's, it's brief up here, we just hand out more detailed, we, we'll go back and huddle, we'll work among staff, and we'll be back for you later this year or early next year to talk about these policy decisions that were raised today. You know, one of the things we talked about, one of the things we have included in all of this in this work plan is staff working immediately as quickly as possible on administrative changes to some of the technical aspects of the concurrency right now, stuff that doesn't need a code change, doesn't need a budget, and so, for example, things like administrative guidelines for credits, um, the, the ways that the traffic studies are required, there are a number of administrative level changes and staff, it, we're not going to wait till next April 1st on those. Those will be worked on this fall and rolled out as soon as possible. Where it doesn't require a code amendment, you can count on your staff team coming back and briefing you before they put it into effect so that you're not surprised, even though it should be good news, and even though it might not require your approval legally, we clearly want to know that you feel that we're going in the right direction. Where it does include a code change, that'll either be just before next April, or if we can do a fall code change if we need it, we'll bring that to you as soon as we're ready. Great. Okay, well, uh, this would be the point uh, where I would uh, invite anyone in the public desiring to comment on this particular item, but uh, since there's no one in the audience uh, uh, to comment, uh, I will not make that announcement. I would just say, again, this was an excellent presentation, if, and if there are those that are watching it, I'd like to make sure that we, we make sure that we get the rebroadcast of this in case someone wants to watch it again, because this is a great primer on uh, impact fees, and you presented it in a clear, concise, and understandable way, is my sense, from the reaction of the council and those present. So, again... Thank you very, very much, and we will move to our next topic. Thank you, Randy. Why don't we take five minutes while, while we reposition a little bit?
Moving now to our uh, next uh, agenda item, regional committees and assignments. And we're very, very fortunate this evening to have the executive director of Sound Cities Association with us, uh, Deanna Dawson, uh, to uh, give SCA's perspective on uh, the importance of uh, 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 city participation in uh, uh, regional activities, uh, regional boards and commissions, and in general, uh, uh, some of the advantages that come from that and the interaction with other folks dealing with many of the similar problems that uh, we deal with, and you can always learn in that environment. So, uh, Deanna, I, I would like to thank you for coming on such short notice, and Paul, I appreciate very, very much your call this morning where you suggested why don't we get Deanna here to uh, work with her as we talk about uh, uh, involvement in uh, uh, regional committees and those assignments. So with that, uh, you're on. Why, thank you. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I've been trying to get out and speak to many of our member cities, and so this is a good opportunity for me to do that. And it's a timely invitation because we do have regional board and committee appointments coming up very soon. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Deanna Dawson. I'm a, a recovering city official myself. I know Fred, actually, because we were on the Sound Transit Board together back when I was on the Edmond City Council. Um, and so that's how I got involved in local government, and now I'm really happy to work with the Sound Cities Association. Um, and I'm going to be pretty brief tonight because we got a little bit of a late start, but um, let me see here if I can, which one of these do I want to, oh, here we go. This is the first thing I like to do when I give one of these presentations is do a little quiz, which is what do one million people, Boeing and Microsoft, all have in common? Anyone? Anyone know the answer to that question? <laughs> Well, they're all in King County, and none of them are in Seattle, because while uh, our cities collectively, the 35 member cities, have about a million people, there's only about 650,000 people who live in Seattle. And it's sort of interesting to me that you always hear about what happens at King County, and you hear about Executive Constantine, or you hear about what's happening in the city of Seattle. I think people often lose that there are all these other cities that are in King County that are doing great things. Um, by the way, we changed our name um, about a year ago now from the Suburban Cities Association to the Sound Cities Association, partly because a lot of our cities, like Kent was a good example, was saying, you know, we don't really identify as being a suburb of anyone. And actually one of your neighbors, Sammamish, said, well, we're a suburban city, but we're a suburb of Redmond, not a suburb of <laughs> Seattle. And so... Cities really wanted to, to express that point of view that there, you know, there are great things going on within their own communities. They're their own cities, and they're not just some sort of appendage of Seattle. Um, and so that's why the name change happened. So um, with that, you know, I usually when I give these presentations, too, I talk a lot about why it's good for our cities collectively to get involved regionally. But I'm going to focus more tonight on why it's good for your city in particular, um, because I think that sometimes gets missed, too. So we were founded in the 1970s to help cities with populations under 150,000, basically every city but um, Seattle, that is, to help um, come together locally and partner regionally to create vi vital livable communities. Um, we do a lot of things. We advocate. We have educational programs for our members. We have networking events. I'm going to talk about all of those a little bit tonight. Um, we have uh, a number of committees that we appoint to, and that's mostly what I'm going to talk about tonight. We staff those committees as well, and that's a nice benefit for cities that are sort of smaller, mid-sized cities like your own, and smaller who don't have a lot of staff on hand. That was one of the things that I found myself when I was on regional boards and committees as a, a council member. I, Edmonds is about the same size, it's like about 40,000 people, and we didn't have staff who would staff me for all the various meetings I would go to. When I, when I was on the Sound Transit Board, I also worked for Snohomish County, and so I was staffed by the county staff, and I would see the difference when I had like really robust staffing and how much I knew about what was happening versus what would happen when I was just on my own as a city member versus you know a city that has a couple hundred thousand people. Boy, they have a lot of staff there. And so that's what we do at SCA. It's nice for the King County cities because people can get more caught up to speed on things. They don't have to feel left in the dark. And we do research and analysis and advocacy for our member cities as well. We do some trainings. Um, we'll do a new training this year for newly elected council members at the end of the year or beginning of next. Um, we do some educational programs. We did one this year about um, we did some um, parliamentary training this year, and we did some training also about um, dealing with open public meetings and public records requests. Um, and then we have networking opportunities. 
both formal, like our networking dinners that we do about five times a year, and I hope you can all, our next one's in September, it's actually out at Snoqualmie Ridge Golf Course, um, and Bob Ferguson, the Attorney General, will be our guest, and so it's a nice way to meet some of your fellow city officials. And there's also informal, we have our public issues committee, and I think, Tola, do you go to those dinners? A lot of people go out to dinner, they carpool down from the north and go out to dinner beforehand. It's a good way to exchange information, and get to know your fellow city council members and mayors, and so forth. Um, one of our board members, Auburn Mayor Pete Lewis, has this phrase he likes to use a lot, which is, if you're not at the table, you might be on the menu, um, which I think is a really good way of looking at it, unfortunately, is that there's lots of issues that happen regionally, and if you're not involved in those conversations, and if you don't know who the people are who are making those conversations, you might find yourself on the short end of the stick, and that's, I think, one of the things that Issaquah should really be thinking about, because you have a lot of major changes going on in your community, and it's helpful to have people know who you are, just not in a sort of sinister sense, but just because people, when they know you, will say, oh, I know Fred, I know Paul, they're good guys, um, you know, look at your point of view a little bit more, and I know there have been a lot of issues that have come up before the pick this year, and Tola has done a really good job on the pick advocating for your city, things like this PSAP consolidation. And I think that, you know, because both Redmond and Issaquah are really active in the public issues committee, people hear about those things and they say, I want to make sure that Issaquah isn't getting left out of these discussions. And um, even though my city may not have their own public safety answering point 911 center, um, you know, I know those guys from Issaquah, so I want to make sure they get a fair shake in the deal, and I think that's helpful. So, Deanna, before you uh, uh, go on, Tolof, what... Uh what are some of the benefits and some things you've enjoyed about representing the city at the PIC and these informal dinners and things like that? Because I know you've, you've come back and brought some good ideas and things uh, and uh, some comments that, that uh, uh, you know, certainly have been helpful, helpful for me. Sure. Well, as uh, you know, uh, as coming up on the end of my first term, uh, as a as a first term person, getting to see all these perspectives from a bunch of other cities uh, was was super educational, and to see how uh, some of the things that I've submitted as goals uh, that I've wanted to see for the city have come out of those conversations, these informal dinners that we do ahead of time at the at the whistle stop uh, <laughs> before before the meeting we have uh, various east side folks who, who who get together and then in the formal sessions uh, at uh, at SCA pick uh, where you really just get to see a lot of different perspectives on it and you also start to see some of the things that you uh, if you think things are in a, are a, a crisis sometimes you realize they're not because other people have bigger problems than you do in some of these some of the things so it helps it helps put some perspective on some things that that maybe aren't as bad as uh, as you think they are when you see see it through some other people's eyes. So it's it's been very helpful that way, and it also uh, just allowed me to see, you know, I didn't I didn't know the Kent Valley that well, right? I didn't know the things that Auburn was going through in Kent and Tukwila, and uh, you know that they're one of the biggest transportation through centers in the United States. I had no idea. So by meeting to by getting to meet those folks, I saw other parts of the King County that that I just didn't see on in Issaquah and Bell Red. So perfect. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things you realize because you hear about these things in both a formal and informal setting. Oh, that's what they're going for, and you get, get a new appreciation for it. And similarly, when Issaquah will go through different issues, I think people will be willing to listen to your perspectives as well for that reason. So, um, oh, Deanna, mm -hmm. uh, an oversight on my part. Uh, there are probably some council members here that you have not met. Oh, so, yeah. uh, Joe, if you would introduce yourself, and then I, we'll just go around and... Uh, and then uh, your role on the council, uh, you know, as chair of the, uh, uh, what do we call that now? <laughs> <laughs> Joe Porter. Hi, nice to I've uh, been on the council before and got appointed to take Mark's place. I'm chair of the infrastructure committee and I also work with Eastside Fire and Rescue. Great, excellent. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Eileen? Got to steal the mic back. Um, Eileen Barber and, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you, uh, I'm chair of services and safety committee, also serving Eastside Fire and Rescue, and early, this is the end of my second term, and there was a time period in my first term that I was actually the representative to the PIC, too. Oh, great. Excellent. We know each other well. Yep. I'm Tola Martz, uh, but, uh, and I'm not chairing any committees this year, but I am on land and shore and uh, infrastructure. I'm Josh Scher. I don't chair any committees anymore either, uh, but I am a vice chair of the Eastside Transportation Partnership. 
That's on the screen right now, by the way. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> I, th I think Tim said he turned it off. I turned it off. He said it was making weird noises. <laughs> I'm Stacy Goodman. I've been on the council for two and a half years, and um, I'm assuming I'm not opposed, but I'm assuming I'll be on the council for another four years in <laughs> January. <laughs> sort of a big writing campaign. Um, I chair Land and Shore Committee, and I'm also on Services and Safety Committee, and I'm the alternate board member for Cascade Water Alliance. Great. Nice to meet you. And I'm Fred Butler. I'm the uh, uh, president of the Issaquah City Council, and I'm on Land and Shore, uh, uh, and uh, also serve on uh, Cascade Water Alliance. I'm their secretary treasurer. Uh, representing uh, uh, Issaquah. Hi, Diane. Diana. Yeah, um, Paul Winterstein. I'm uh, Deputy Council President. I'm on the uh, Services and Safety with Eileen and uh, Stacy. And regionally, I'm the Vice Chair of the East Side Human Services Forum. So. Uh, and I'm Bob Harrison. I'm the City Administrator. Thanks for coming tonight. And, um, and thank you for helping to uh, enhance this discussion. Um, as council recalls, we talked a little bit uh, about 10, 15 minutes at our council goal session about what our regional footprint ought to be and where we, sh where, you know, where we've invested our time in terms of regional uh, impacts and regional representation, and given our time frame and our uh, growth, uh, where we ought to be thinking about investing our time. And so, we did update. We handed out, sent out to you this list. That was last updated in 2005, so it's been about eight years. It's been kind of interesting to see where this is. And so um, Deanna will be talking about some of these committees and commissions tonight. But it, if you went through here, you saw that AF, uh, which stood for Ava Freisinger, was on a lot of these commissions and committees. And so, you know, one of the things that's obviously happening this year is both Joe and uh, Fred are running for mayor. And, you know, they'll ultimately have to make some decisions about what regional commissions and committees they decide. Uh, to participate in, but um, again, the, you know, as we start to thinking about this as a council, um, and you evaluate this, um, you know, what, where should our efforts, where should we be represented, where should we be having those discussions, and and council did take an action last year to hire Doug Levy, so we're now down in Olympia, and you've done a lot of work with Doug as part of our lobbyists, so um, this is kind of a continuation of that ongoing discussion I think that we've had uh, in terms of what our regional uh, impact and, and footprint should be. And I'll say this, I think um, in my experience, both at SCA and before that, um, most cities don't have every single person on the council on regional boards and committees, and they don't need to. Um, but it's a good idea to have at least a couple of people who are really active. And I think especially when people are starting out, they like to try to focus internally on the city. And sometimes being on something like the public issues committee can be good because it gives you a, an early regional perspective on things. but. Um, as you said, you've got a lot of people who've been really active, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, but your mayor has been very active, and um, council president has been active, and he, but he's term limited on the regional transit committee, and Ava's going off a bunch of committees, and so it's a good time to be thinking about those types of things. One of the things I'll say, too, is whoever gets elected as mayor, I hope you will come to the um, North End Mayor's meetings. We have those monthly, and they're a really good place for the mayors to get together and chat about issues. Um, and I've mentioned this to, to Paul on the phone today, and I'll mention it again now, is that um, your neighboring city to Sammamish is very actively engaged regionally. They're on a lot of committees. They're, they've got a board member at SCA. They've got um, a number of um, uh, people who go, they've, they've got their mayor that goes to the North End mayors a lot. And so there's a lot of issues that go on between Issaquah and Sammamish, and we always hear Sammamish's point of view first when we're at those things because they're there. And so um, I think it's a great idea for Issaquah to make sure that they're keeping engaged in that regional conversation so that everybody hears both sides when there is a dispute between two cities. And SCA doesn't get involved in those types of issues. When we've got divisive issues, like we call them, at the Public Issues Committee, we won't take a position and say, yeah, we've decided we like Issaquah's or Sammamish's position. But it's a good idea just to you know, be in that regional conversation. And as I put up here on this slide, um, you've got people who are really pretty active. And I'll say something about it, too, is that I think cities also, as I was saying, that many cities um, have a couple people who get involved. What happens in a lot of cities is you'll have maybe two people, and this was my experience when I was in the Edmond City Council. We had Dave Erling was our council president. He's mayor now, but he left for several years of office. And we had um, um, 
gosh, I can't even think of his name, uh, Richard Marin, Richard. who were both really engaged, and I was pretty involved on regional issues. And then when we were all gone, people who were on the council then would ne were never involved regionally. And so Edmund's you know, sort of role in the region really dropped off a lot, I think, because they just didn't have that history. And people didn't want to run against those people because they were the ones, that was kind of their, their deal, was they were on regional boards and committees. But it caused a kind of a real gap. And so you're very smart as a council to be thinking about how to fill that gap before the gap occurs. Because right now, you've got a lot of goodwill in the community and you've got a mayor who has been very engaged and you've got, you know, um, Councilor Butler's been on a number of committees as well. Um, and I would say this too, is that I know both, I know Paul and Tola from PIC, and it's unusual to know the alternates from PIC. So, you know, you're doing a great job by being an active alternate. And I would say, you know, PIC is open to everybody, even if you're not on it. So it's a good place to be just to learn about regional issues. Same thing with the boards and committees. You don't have to be on the board and committee to be there and understand the issues that are happening. Um, you're also fortunate because your city administrator and deputy city administrator are very active in the city managers and administrators group. And you're sort of running the show this year, the, one of the three people running the show this year, Bob. So that's great. You've got a, a, a good voice then among the other city managers. And I think that also helps. Um, and as you can see here, we've got a, we've got a really good board. Um, and I would encourage you, if you have issues that are going on also, by the way, reach out to your representatives on the board if you've got things that you think should be taken up or you've got problems going on. Um, and we are going to have, I, the North, this is an interesting thing I'll talk about a little bit tonight too, is that we've got a lot of really active North End people and we don't have as many vacancies this year coming up for the North End as we do the South. And with the board, I don't think we'll have necessarily someone who's retiring from the North. But in the future, I would encourage you to try to get some back on the SCA board because it's a, it's a good group of people. This is a really active and interesting group of people to work with. Um, I'm not gonna focus on this as much because really, I, again, I wanna focus more on the benefits disqual, but I will note to you that um, cities represent an increasing percentage of the population in the county. The growth is happening in the cities, not unincorporated areas, obviously. But SCA member cities are also an increasingly large percent of that population. Most of the growth in the county is happening in cities other than Seattle and other than Bellevue. And um, our cities do have a large voice in regional committees if we act together. Um, our cities don't have a lot of power by themselves, but if they come together, they can actually have a lot of power. And we've been actually getting a lot of good results by working with the county and working with City of Seattle on different issues. Um, and that's how we help do that, by bringing everyone together through things like the Public Issues Committee. And each city has, I'll go back to this one, has an equal voice on the Public Issues Committee. So although you're a sort of, you know, mid-sized city in the greater scheme of things in King County, your voice is as powerful as that of a Kent or a Kirkland or a Federal Way that are much larger cities than yours. And so that's a nice feature, I think, that everyone gets to be at the table and have that equal dialogue. I will also say that I think we've been trying really hard, and I don't know if we're succeeding, but trying to make the meetings a little bit more transparent and make sure that some cities and people who've been there for a long time don't just sort of dominate the conversation so that new voices can be heard and that everybody really understands what's happening. We're, we're getting there, I think. We're not there yet. Um, but so the Public Issues Committee gives policy direction to all the different boards and committees that we have appointing authority to. So when, these peop when people are on, say, the Regional Transit Committee, the person who's on the Regional Transit Committee is not there. It's not just like Fred's there representing what Fred thinks should happen to Regional Transit or even what Issaquah thinks should happen, although certainly he brings that, you know, that hat of wearing an Issaquah perspective there. But he's also speaking on behalf of all the cities, all the 35 member cities that are in the Sound Cities Association. Um, and that's kind of a nice feature of this organization is that it helps make sure that everybody, that people are working together and really engaging collaboratively and not just going off and doing their own thing. Um, and so that's why, and that's another reason why being on the Public Issues Committee is a nice place to be because you can help give direction to people, even if you don't have a voice on an individual committee. And so that's another way to be involved. Um, your city can still have a lot of influence, even if you're not on an individual committee. But really, no matter what kinds of issues you're interested in, if it's public safety, if it's human services, economic development, land use, transportation, there are committees for all those things. Um, Again, there's more than 25. I think we have 26 this year that there are vacancies on. And I'm actually gonna go now through, and I'll pass this out to you. I've got a list for you of all the committees and boards that we know there are vacancies on this year because somebody's either retiring or because um, they're term limited. 
And um, last year, the membership unanimously adopted the idea of having six-year term limits on the boards and committees, um, just because there wasn't a lot of turnover. And I will tell you, I was telling for this earlier, that the people who weren't sure about that, the, 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 the reason they said they didn't like it, they said, well, what about someone like a Fred Butler? Fred, we're gonna lose that institutional knowledge on the Regional Transit Committee? That's terrible, we can't lose Fred Butler on the RTC. Well, I said, but Fred has keeps applying for the Transportation Policy Board, and there haven't been any vacancies there for several years. So even though this will mean, we, and we did give a, a more than a year notice before we would have these things take place, um, that maybe he could apply for that, or maybe you know other folks from your city would have a chance to be on RTC because you know there'll be some more vacancies there. And in fact, there's going to be several vacancies on the RTC this year. Some of these, I put north and south because we try to have a regional balance on things. We try to have a balance of Snoqualmie Valley, South Valley, north and south. Um, but they're not really hard and fast. Some of the bigger ones, they are pretty, we really try to have a balance. But some of the smaller ones, you know, Board of Health, for example, there's three vacant, there's three seats on that. And so you can't have half and half from the north and south. And so, although there's a north, quote unquote, vacancy this year because Ava is the person whose seat's being given up, it might go to the south because it's typically had two seats from the north and one from the south. David Baker from Kenmore is on there, as well as someone from Auburn. So these are the committees that we know will have vacancies on. I would say, though, you don't have to think of just these as you're making your applications because um, you never know what's going to happen. There are always people who they have a job change or something like that, or they just don't have time to commit to these different committees. So. Um, even if you look at the list and say, well, boy, it looks like somebody uh, who's doing a good job is on that committee. I'm also going to pass around this booklet for you, and this is actually on our website as well. Um, this has detailed explanations about all of the different boards and committees, and it talks about when they meet, and it talks about what they do, and it talks about some of the issues they have coming up. It tells you who's on it right now. Um, and what jurisdiction they're from, so you can get a sense of maybe where you want to make sure that there's more of a voice for your area of the county on a committee. Mm -hmm. um, and it also tells you who staffs it from our staff and their contact information. So we have two policy an analysts in addition to myself, uh, Monica Whitman and Doreen Booth. They're both really great people. Um, they're very knowledgeable and they're very willing to help you decide <coughs> what works for you. So, you know, one of the things to take a look at is, you know, what works with your work schedule and your life schedule and so forth. But um, and I'm happy to run through each of these if you want me to and explain what goes on on these committees. That, there's a lot, though. And so if people have questions about individual committees, I'd be happy to answer any of them. And I'm also going to pass my card around so that if you have questions down the road, you just call me anytime or email me. I'm happy to um, discuss any of these with you. I noted the ones that... Um, you had seats on that you're not going to have seats on anymore unless you reapply. Um, we don't appoint to sound transit, by the way, so that's why that's not one of the things that's on there, the county executive. But we do have some input on that because we talk to the county. We meet monthly with the county executive and talk with him about things like that. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to chat with all of you about. And again, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have. Um, Oh, there's one other thing I was going to mention to you because in addition to things like the networking dinners and the PIC meetings in terms of um, networking opportunities, we also have a new thing we're starting this month, actually next week, which is a um, women's leadership breakfast. A lot of our women elected officials were feeling like they didn't have a place that was sort of theirs. Um, a lot of them found it difficult with you know work and child care responsibilities to go to those dinners. And so we're going to start doing a breakfast once a month. Um, and the first breakfast topic is going to be about why it's important to get involved on regional boards and committees, <laughs> and also why it's important. And also, you know, at the national level, we've got some people who are really involved with National League of Cities. How, and then, for example, we actually have um, one of our city council members today, Tana Sen, from the city of Mercer Island, has been really active in this, just got sworn in to be the newest legislator from the 41st. We have, um, which is part of your city, um, we have two other city members who I know are competing for this, this uh, soon to be opening in the 33rd. And so I think some of those folks are going to talk a little bit about, you know, how getting involved in those boards and committees can also help you if you want to move on to other types of offices. But also, um, they're going to talk a little bit about why it's important within your city to have some diversity on your city committees that you appoint to and why that helps out um, with getting good new people on your council, too. So those, that's going to be on September 19th at 7.30 in Mercer Island, if any of you would like to attend that. So with that, um, 
I want to thank you for being members of the Sound Cities Association. Issaquah has got a really good reputation. And I think, I guess I will say this before I conclude, is that um, what, people often ask, well, how do they make the decisions on who gets appointed to boards and committees? And so I'm going to demystify that a little bit, actually, before I leave. Um, there is a committee of four people called the Pick Nominating Committee, and there is one person from each caucus. So there's one person from Snoqualmie Valley, one from South Valley, one from North, and one from South. Your North representative is Hank Margison of uh, Redmond. And they meet, and they go through all the applications, and they take it very seriously. This is not just a we know this guy. They look at people's backgrounds and qualifications. They don't always just reappoint people who've been on boards and committees. One of the things they look at in that respect is, do people show up for meetings? Do they show up for the caucus meetings before the meetings? Because we have meetings before our meetings, and we don't just go in there and have people go in there cold. They meet beforehand. Um, do they go in and represent the will of all the cities, or do they just go in there and sort of do their own thing? That's a sure way to get kicked off a committee, by the way, um, by doing that. Um, and so they, and they try to make sure that each city has a good representation on the committee. Um, so if there are places that you know you really want to get active in your city, it's really important to your city that you have a seat on one particular thing. Let us know that because they usually try to make sure that cities have some good, um, you know, good, a good balance, and that you know one city's not left off. But they also, I think, there is this sort of intangible factor of like, do we know these people? Are they people that we feel comfortable are going to really you know do things? And so I think it's a good idea to get involved in you know a committee. Because if you've done some committee and done a good job on that and people have gotten to know you and feel comfortable with you, it's easier to get onto your committee of your choice, which some of those are harder to get onto because they're in high demand. Or be, get involved with PIC. And right now it's great because Issaquah, I think, has a really good reputation in the region. You've had some people who've been really involved and you know, you've been really involved at ETP and people know you through that. And the people who are on the PIC from Issaquah, are, they speak up and they are thoughtful about what they're talking about at the meetings. And so I think that you would do well if you all wanted to get involved in some more committees or some different committees than you have already. So I'm really going to stop talking now and answer questions if you have any questions. Questions? Joe? Well, considering that I'm the only one around the table that will not be on the council if I lose the election, oh, okay. can I, is it all right to still apply with the understanding that if I am not elected, then? Yes. Okay. And I, I will say this, though, that has come into play sometimes where people look at it and they go, mm, is this person going to be around? But it happens all the time. I remember um, two years ago when I first I, I came on in November two years ago to SCA, that was when I first got hired, there were people that they were really sort of nervous. But they actually what they did was they appointed them and then made backup plans. So they wouldn't have to just completely go back to the table um, because there were some people that we thought were going to lose who won and vice versa two years ago. And so um, there were, I can think of one councilman from Lake Forest Park in particular who I think people thought was going to win his mayor's race and he did not win. And there were some committees that had some vacancies because of that. So we don't do our final appointments until after the election. Um, although the, sometimes the committee does meet in October. They're, they're, they're due in October. But we probably won't. I think this year, even do our first round of um, appointments until after the elections over. So certainly apply, and then um, depending on what happens, you know, who, um, that will be what happens. And then what happens actually after that, I should have clarified, it goes from the PIC nominating committee to the PIC, the Public Issues Committee. They all then vote, and I don't think I've ever seen an occurrence where the PIC has, you know, not appointed somebody, and then it goes to the board for final confirmation. So. There's, there's a few steps along the way for people to. But yeah, I would say absolutely people should apply regardless. Um, yeah. Yes. Maybe you already mentioned this. Uh, what, what type of commitment for is, is the range of commitments for these? Yeah. I mean, there are some committees that really only meet like three times a year. I think the Domestic Violence Initiative meets three, maybe four times a year. Um, there are other committees that meet monthly and sometimes more than monthly. and. Um, have you know a couple hours plus an hour of a caucus meeting, and so that really does vary. Um, and some of them, most of them, are during the day, and that's and that's not something we do. They're not committees that we decide when they're meeting, other than the public issues committee. Those are things that are they're either count they're at the county council, they're at the Puget Sound Regional Council, or what have you. Um, there is, I know one committee I can think of, the Regional Law Safety and Justice Committee meets at 7.30 a.m., which is not very convenient for those of us who like to sleep in late, but it is very convenient for people who, you know, work full-time and work full-time downtown because it meets in downtown Seattle. 
Um, you know, so people, I think, often can find, like, well, my boss will let me take off, you know, six times a year in the afternoon for this meeting. But so it is something to think about because people really are expected to commit to being to all those meetings. And also, even if you're an alternate, because alternates are often seated at these committees, um, even if they aren't having the vote, they're at the table. And so it's important to have all those voices there. So even if you're an alternate, you're expected to be there the whole time. Um, speaking of 730 meetings, we will likely need another ETP representative, uh, assuming that uh, Council President Butler would still be attending for sound transit to ETP, even though both of us attend those meetings with the mayor's uh, retirement, that would create a second seat, official seat. So just for everyone around the table to think about, um, we would be a member short, and that is a 7.30 second mm -hmm. Friday of every month. Mm -hmm. um, but we will need and want to have a second member starting in uh, January for that organization. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested. And we do get an alternate, too, although I don't think we've ever really utilized we, that. We have, but <laughs> the alternate hasn't been very active. A lot of the alternates haven't been very active. ETP is an interesting one because there are three sub area regional transportation boards and they all have their own kind of different flavor and I don't know if you ever go to the seashore one because that one's a lot of the north end people go to both. Um, ETP is interesting to me in the sense that there are a lot of people who participate and are very engaged there who are not actually voting members and I think it's the only of the sub areas and you can get the impression that that things are very different there from the conversation than what the actual votes are because yeah it's an, it's an interesting one. <laughs> So we'll, we will need someone, though. Um, so if you're interested, think about it. Yeah. So it's, a nice, it's, a, it's nice to have more voices at that table sometimes, too, to make sure that the perspectives that actually have a vote are there saying things. Uh, could you, um, what other ways in the last year or two um, would um, activities of, whether it be a committee or the mm -hmm. pick itself or the board, mm -hmm where we may have seen the, their influence on whether it be county or maybe state level issues. I mean, I know we did quite a bit. I say we, I'm thinking SCA. Yeah. Just uh, around transportation, there's a lot of participation there. What are some of the other things? And I, I'm just trying to maybe shed a little bit of light of what has happened regionally uh, and, and how uh, SCA and participation in any of these committees, you know, it's really, dealing with real issues that influence us regionally. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, collectively one of the things we have spent a lot of time on is transportation, and we aren't there yet, but I think we are working further towards potentially having a third special session and getting a transportation package passed, and that's been something that SCA has been very involved in. Um, I will mention to you all, actually, that there is another – um, there are two efforts going on right now. Um, there's a Keep Washington Rolling Coalition as well as a Move King County Now Coalition <coughs> that SCA is involved in that are meeting. And that King County group is meeting, having a large group, um, which you all would be welcome to attend on Thursday morning at 10 a.m. at the Seattle Chamber to talk about next steps on that. Um, and, I, and so there have been a lot of... Um, um, forums that SCA has participated in. Our members have been at, very active down in Olympia. Um, and we've heard back from legislators that we would not have gotten as far as we have this year, but for the efforts of our member cities um, and their, you know, sort of constant putting the pressure on. And I think that's something that if, if it's going to happen this year and if we are going to see a transportation package, and if, which will – part of the reason it's very important, obviously, is because if there is no transportation package passed or if there's no way to – um, come up with some local revenue for transit. We're looking at 17% cuts to metro service in the next year, and that's going to really adversely affect residents here in Issaquah, I would say, in particular, perhaps, um, because for, for two reasons, not just because of those citizens who ride the bus into work because your routes are, the, the outlying routes are the ones that are probably going to be really badly affected, but also for commuters on the roads trying to get into, you know, um, areas further closer on the east side or into Seattle and so forth because if all those people who were on the buses are now in cars, boy, it's going to be a lot worse. Um, so that's one particular issue. I've been spending a, an inordinate amount of time on solid waste issues this past year, and I don't know if my, I've my been told several years ago that I was going to spend a lot of my job working on garbage. I would have been <laughs> rather shocked and dismayed, but um, there was an interlocal which your city signed on to 
um, which is going to save ratepayers around the county several millions of dollars, which the negotiations on that had really stalled. Um, and then it was SCA that really stepped in and said to the county, you know, we need to get back to the table on this. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in concert with the conservation district um, and with funding for the, the RIAs for salmon recovery efforts this past year. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other specific issues. We've taken some positions on some different issues. There was a, um, a tourism bill down in Olympia that we were successful in working on this year that's bringing some local, uh, good local revenues back into cities in terms of the lodging tax that was going to expire. Um, we've also been doing some work well, we've done not a lot of, we took position on it. We haven't done much on it other than that, actually, but is on the Marketplace Fairness Act, which would um, bring some sales tax revenues dollars into our cities. But um, I could, uh, there's a lot more than that. It's just if the hour is late and I won't, I, but I actually have a, um, a sort of little chart I prepared for our board recently, which I could send to the council if you're interested in seeing some more work on that. Probably can you see some, some other issues that we've worked on at the pick this year? I think, by the way, that one of the things I know is going to be coming up is this issue of the um, public safety answering points consolidation. I think that's going to be really important to your city. Um, we were, through our advocacy, now have another city seat on that committee. Um, you probably saw an email I sent around that, um, so we'll have another city voice there, even first a city that doesn't have their own PSAP and doesn't have a direct contractual relationship with one, which I think will be helpful to our member cities that do have their own public safety answering points. Um, because that will, um, I think they'll have more sympathy for your plight, maybe, than somebody else might, so. Do you recall the deadline that to apply? Oh, it's in October. <coughs> um, I want to say it's October 28th, but that might be wrong. But I, the 18th. 18th. Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> if you get it in 10 days late, you can say it's because I do So it's October 18th. <laughs> um, and so the committee will meet. It'll come to the pick in November, and we may, I, I'm going to recommend that we meet after the election just because there's a lot of elections going on this year, and there's a lot of people in hard elections this year that we aren't going to know the results. We may not know right after the election in some of those cases, but there are a lot of mayors up for election this year who are facing challengers and a lot of mayors who are retiring this year. And this, this is one of the biggest number of vacancies that I think we've seen in a very long time. Um, of people, you know, leaving office or facing challengers, so it's going to be interesting for sure. So, I had another question. Oh, yeah. So, uh, obviously, regional committees is one way, and 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 participation in the pick, as as we've already discussed. Um, but I'm, I'm so I'm just completing my second year as uh -huh. elected. So a lot of uh, this is I can, I can still play the rookie card. Uh, and, and a lot of this is still is still pretty new to me, but it's been my participation in the pick. One of the things that uh, has really stood out to me is um, how I've seen other cities and their representatives at the pick uh, come. You know, with they vetted some of the issues with their fellow council members prior to the pick, mm -hmm. and that's something I think we're making some good improvements on. But I was just wondering, you know, as far as you know, so we're, we're a member of, of Sound Cities. Mm -hmm. And what other ways, you know, you know um, and maybe I've just named it, but that we as a council can, you know, in that way, you know, participate for the benefit of the Sound Cities in total a, as a member, but yeah. not just, again, not just participating on the committees, but just for mm -hmm. the issues and then preparing our representatives for our yeah. public issue committee meetings. Well, and so the way that ideally it happens, and it happens more or less successfully between different cities is that an issue will come to the pick. And the way that it comes to the pick is usually because somebody on a committee says, we've got this big issue coming up and we want to make sure that we're taking direction from all our member cities. Or staff will hear about something or we'll be at North End Mayors and some issue will come up and we'll be like, wow, I wonder if we could be helpful on that. Um, there was an issue, there's been a couple issues in the city of Shoreline this year where there was a property they wanted to purchase from the county that the county was surplusing and um, the, the, the water and sewer district was opposing it. They didn't want them to, they wanted to get it. And so we ended up helping weigh in and the county council ended up voting to sell it to the city of Shoreline, partly because we put a lot of pressure on them, frankly. Um, and so that's kind of a discrete thing that came before SCA. Another one is um, an issue that's going to be coming before Sound Transit that we haven't taken a formal position on yet, but um, city of Shoreline has a very strong opinion on where this one of the station locations should be in Shoreline, it should be at 145th versus 155th, and asked us collectively to take a position so that it would be like this is not just Shoreline saying this or a couple of cities right there. This is the 35 <coughs> member cities, and it, it's pretty powerful. We've had some issues. Um, well, this is another example of something that we're working on 
um, by the way, that I should have said is that on, speaking of garbage, on the transfer station plan update, you know, you may, there's a, there, there's a right now, a planned northeast station, which could be located right around here somewhere, potentially. Um, and our member cities have all gotten <coughs> together and said, you know, we're not so sure we really need to build all of these transfer stations. Maybe we can downsize it, save $80 million by not building all of these stations. And so there may, that's something that's in progress right now. But the county council ended up enacting a budget proviso at, because of the actions that we were taking and saying to the Solid Waste Division, yeah, yeah, I know you keep saying you're going to do this, but you're not listening to them enough, but the Sound Cities wants this you don't get the rest of your money for these projects until you do this review that we've been asking you to do. So things are happening. We're, we're getting the attention of the right folks when we all get together and work on an issue. Um, and so there are issues that you may have here in your city or issues in your, you know, it's your sub-region of the county that would come up where you could bring them to the pick, like Shoreline did on this 145th Street station alignment and say, you know, we really want all our cities to get behind this issue. And it's been pretty successful when cities have done that. Um, you know, again, if it's an issue between two cities, like if there's an issue between Issaquah and Sammamish, we're not gonna wade into that because we don't wanna have one of our cities be upset with us, you know. Um, but, uh, but if there are issues where, um, you know, you've got a dispute with the county or something like that. Well, by the way, I was gonna mention, I'm gonna be giving a presentation at the Boundary Review Board on Thursday, so if there's any sort of message, subtle message you would like me to communicate to them uh, about anything. But I, and I know that you guys have got this issue with Sammamish there, but I was, it was, I was, um, I think there are, one of the things that I wanted to communicate to them, and I wish that they would sort of understand more what's going on within cities, is that, you know, I think cities really are doing things because they think it's the right thing to do, and they believe, it's not because they're trying to just, they'll get rich on doing some of these annexations, it's because they're trying to follow a GMA. They're trying to, um, act within what the law is requiring them to do. And I sometimes think that the BRB is suspicious of cities in a way that maybe, that I don't quite understand. And I think if they sort of really understood what was happening at your city councils, maybe they would look at things a little bit differently. But that's my perspective. Um, so I guess it, there's lots of things that could happen within your city that could, that could help be helped by having your friends and neighbors helping to weigh in, I guess. Um, and I don't know enough about the particular individual issues you have going on right now to say, well, this is one that, um, but there may be other issues too. I, I often think that there are, are ways that we could be jointly um, sharing information and maybe doing, um, you know, common codes with among our cities to help encourage economic development in our region, like certain things that, you know, why does it always have to be like every single city has a little tiny different bit of something here, there, and the other place? So there, there's probably more that we can be doing. Um, for those of you who attend our networking dinners, we've started doing these presentations, which are called the RISE presentations, which stands for Recognize, Inspire, Share, and Engage. And so we've been sort of sharing best practices about some of the cool things that cities are doing. And so that's another good thing, because you learn, just learn, well, wow, Redmond's doing that? We could do that. That's a neat idea. So. And last uh, December, uh, we did mm -hmm. uh, the RISE presentation. Yeah. David Fujimoto mm -hmm. and the lighting here in, in the downtown. Lighting. Is yeah. Fun. Yeah, it was a very cool presentation. You guys are doing a lot of neat things. We actually had a city manager meeting where you shared some information about this, um, that really deep green project that you have here in the city and about your fire station and mm -hmm. then did a tour of the fire station. And people were really intrigued by the whole thing about um, you can invest some more dollars early on in a project and save money down the road in terms of operating expenses because it's a lot easier to get capital dollars than it is O&M. And so even if it costs a little bit more money up front, it's smart. And so I think that a lot of cities learned a lot from Issaquah on that presentation too. That's good. Yeah, it was a really good presentation. So, <clears throat> no, um, you know, when looking through the, the types of committees, um, and we're just talking about, you know, the stuff that we're doing in Issaquah, I noticed from a sustainability perspective, there's focus on economic development, mm -hmm. there's social, you know, uh, types of committees. Mm -hmm. What sort of environmental issues does SCA tackle? Uh, I mean, certainly those those issues exist uh, for the members of SCA, mm -hmm. um, and there might be policy differences that can be made mm -hmm. with input from jurisdictions on, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go down an enumerated list, but yeah. just looking at it from that perspective, um, are there any committees that deal with environmental type of issues? I would say that you typically see those issues come up on things like the GMPC and the GMPB, like the Growth Management Policy Board and Planning Council. Um, and what you, you tend to see at those 
is sort of a, um, sometimes a false dichotomy, but sometimes not between like development interests and environmentalist interests, right? And I think that's one of the things that, to be honest with you, I would, my observation coming into this organization in the last two years is that there have been a lot more people who have been engaged on issues who are much more developer friendly and not as many people who are concerned about issues of sustainability and so forth. And so I think that you start to see more of a balance though, the more you know, different people, different types of people get elected to office and getting engaged. And I think it's important to have that balance and for people to be having those <coughs> discussions so it's not just one side of the equation. Um, and I think, totally you can probably speak to that in some of the things, discussions you've seen at the Public Issues Committee. You, you can tell who's on which side of that aisle from time to time. And I think the good thing about these discussions is that usually you'll see people try to come to a consensus, not just a lowest common denominator position, but a real consensus about, you know, what is the interest that our cities collectively have on this. Um, there's going to be another committee that's going to be coming forward, I hope. Um, the Conservation District has um, agreed to put together a new sort of advisory committee um, as part of some of the work that we've been doing um, there. And so that's a committee where you'll see some potential to have some things there. The Flood Control District is another place where you see a lot of um, issues both about um, w water issues in general, which sort of to touch both on um, you see, actually, you see tension in that one between issues of like urban flooding issues versus like s versus stream flooding type of issues. So it's kind of an interesting mix there. But those are some of the committees that are probably the most likely. Although I think you know transportation committees sometimes have those as well. Um, PSRC executive board has from time to time has issues relating to that. I do want to just add, though, that I, I, I do think, you know, you mentioned earlier about <clears throat> hoping that people, uh, you know, don't act just for their city. And I think that the PIC does actually a pretty good job of that because you mentioned about, like, environmental issues. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, like, generally speaking, you know, people in, in the PIC don't just, like, stand up and entirely take you know, an entirely green position or an entirely yeah. pro-business position. Right. I think people take that responsibility pretty seriously. You know certain people have certain interests, but I think that as a whole on the pick, people are, are pretty good about uh, trying to provide a balanced view. And if they're really, if they're representing their councils, they sort of have to, right? Because most yeah. councils have a pretty balanced yeah. or a somewhat balanced point of view. Actually, the one, the other one that I neglected to mention is the South Central Action Area Caucus Group, which is not self-evident what that would ever be, but it's actually, it's the group of the, um, the Puget Sound Partnership. And so that's actually probably the most likely one where you'd be able to engage on those types of issues. Um, and we, a lot of these committees, boy, you sure never would guess what they do by their names, but that's the, uh, the Puget Sound Partnership is like the, you know, protect Puget Sound, um, protect salmon group. So that's probably the, the best place to, if you were really concerned about the, like water quality and, you know, um, fish issues and that sort of thing, that would be a good one to be on. Okay, Bob? Um, just a question, quick question and comment. Um, one is uh, most of these positions are elected officials, yes. are they not? They are. Yeah, so, and I don't have to tell you this, obviously, being elected officials, but you serve on a whole variety of things in addition to this regional uh, areas that you have a lot of demands on your time. So not only do you have your council committees, but some of these things like um, that are on this list, the... Uh, chamber rep so that we've had a staff yeah. rep to the chamber but we've had a council rep to the chamber um, fish is another good example <coughs> we've had a kind of a you know they're a partner uh, really with the city and we've had reps there they're not a, an official city appointment but by virtue of the fact that it's been important to us we've generally had someone from the city serve on these things so it's a lot for all of you to be able to put on your tables and your plate so um, I don't know what process you want to think about uh, working through this because we do have a deadline coming up on that and typically you do your assignments in January after the newest mm -hmm. board uh, is a is seated um, but you know if there's anything I can do to help uh, in terms of your decision making please let me know so. and I should mention something else about this as well procedurally um, is that um, if more than one person from a city wants to be on a committee, we don't choose between them. And so what a lot of cities do is they have the council president or the city administrator or whoever 
um, ask for everyone to submit their interests to them, and then they sort of talk with them, or they, and sometimes they'll actually talk to them too and be like, hey, I really want to have a seat on the RTC this year because it's really important. So that's one of the things you should think about too is what are the areas where your city is going to be having issues coming up? Like if you were a city that had a lot of transit issues coming up, you'd really want to make sure you got a new person on RTC. And then have whoever it is, whether it's the council president or the mayor or the city administrator, sort of vet them and then send a, a list to SCA. And then we also know, okay, this is something that is important to Issaquah. This is not just some, because there are, there are councils, I don't think yours is one of them, but there are some councils where there's real splits between the council. There's one person on the council who's kind of an outlier, you know what I mean? But I think, I mean, my sense is that you guys have a pretty good working relationship and so forth. Um, but that's, it is an interesting um, dynamic in some cities. But so it's, it's nice to have the city get together and talk about those things and so you don't have gaps or two people applying for the same thing or so forth. And sometimes there'll be someone who's leaving from a city and the other council members don't even know and they would have had a good opportunity to get another seat on that committee, but they didn't because they didn't talk about it. So I think it's great that you guys are talking about this out loud at your council committee meeting rather than just individually sending things off. It's really, so I really thank you for inviting me tonight. I think in the past it's sort of been self you know, people self-selected and submitted individually, and there has not been competition between more than one council member for a position. Yeah. Uh, but one of the reasons we're talking is trying to encourage more participation. But there are a lot of things that work against that. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, there's council business and jobs and family and all of that, and. The fact that some of the meetings aren't very, I mean, work against you, the meeting times and things mm -hmm. like that. It's hard. And then many of the, you know, just to point out, many of the assignments uh, other than SCA, you, uh, uh, there are other committees in conjunction with that. So, yeah. you know, at Sound Transit, there. There are four other opportunities to serve, and there's an expectation that you'll serve on one of those committees. Uh, ETP, it's volunteer. Uh, Josh, you volunteered on the rules, uh, or you shepherded us through that process. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say it would probably be helpful if you are considering a Suburban Cities Association. You know, to let, uh, 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 let the rest of the council know that you are interested. I don't see a need to set up a formal vetting process unless everyone here surprises me and uh, <laughs> really <laughs> gets interested. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to serve. You've got a lot of information. You've got the... Uh, uh, the letter from uh, Sound Cities Association. You've got uh, what uh, Lisa put together on other opportunities and that uh, details in great detail what uh, Ava is involved in. I know that there are some things on that list where individual council members have an interest in those, those topics. Uh, Arch is on there. Uh, uh, Eastside Public Safety, uh, EPSCA, mm -hmm. is something, Tola, that you've sort of been, uh, you know, with the PSAP, and uh, you've shown some interest uh, there. Uh, or regional law and social justice. Yeah, I mean, so there, there are lots. So I would just ask that you take a look at this, uh, look at your work schedule, look at your council commitments, look at your family commitments, mm -hmm. and if there is a way and there is a topic or something that really strikes your fancy, and because my personal experience, and I'm in a little different situation than most of you because I'm retired, mm -hmm. uh, but the Regional Transit Committee, uh, I was involved uh, through that process and two major decisions that shaped uh, transit uh, policy. When I first got on, we were, it was 40, 40, 20, mm -hmm. which is a term that I've tried to forget. <laughs> but that is what, uh, uh, you know, what drove the allocation of new service hours on, you know, transit service hours. And then, because I, 
you know, being on the Regional Transit Committee, the executive appointed me to the, the Regional Transit Task Force, where we came up with a new way of allocating new service hours. It's a little frustrating because there haven't been a lot of new service hours to allocate, uh, but at least we, uh, it was not allocating new service hours, but how you reduce the system also. And that's the work I'm very, very proud of. And each of these things, you know, over time uh, will result, uh, I'm guessing, in a major policy uh, uh, decision that you can say I had a little bit of a part in it. So that's enough of the salesperson <laughs> job. Well, and this year, unfortunately, if we don't get any action from the legislature and if the county doesn't go do something else, you might be on RTC looking at ha making recommendations on how to cut 17% from the And so you would want to be at so the table there. <laughs> yeah, that's something that's going to be a really hard decision to make. So. Okay, any other questions? Great discussion. Thanks for coming on short notice. This has been very, very helpful and very, very useful. Is there any other business than we indeed are adjourned? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you might want to